And I think we're live. I think all the button pushes happened in the proper order. Oh, I see we're still, we still get some people out of order. All right, let me see if I can correct something here. Uh, in the meantime, while I'm uh, playing around with uh, buttons and screens and things, welcome to another episode of Legends of the Drowned Isles Campaign 2, The Great Confusion. <laughs> Didn't really mean that to be as uh, accurate a title. Uh, did I just close something? Hang on now. Our pictures all disappeared. <laughs> we are ghosts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it... Uh, oh, it minimized the video. That's... A, uh, all the tools are up to their usual tricks, and once again, I think it uh, it lost where you are. Here we are. Please, apolo I, or please apologize. No, I will apologize. Please bear with the crazy confusion in technology which happens after a period of downtime. We'll call it that. Legends of the Drowned Isles is a homebrew D&D campaign. Fifth Ed, uh, for the time being, who knows if there's another edition on its way or if we'll ever change out of this, if we'll ever finish this campaign. Who knows? Uh, we will certainly make an endeavor to do so. I am Mark Dean Caffinated One. I'm the uh, host, DM, GM, and uh, general uh, botherer of plots, I guess I will say. And I am very happily joined by my players, starting on my left with Pat. All right, my name is Pat. I am playing Silas Marsh. My name is Marie, uh, and I am playing Annie. And I'm Nax, and I'm playing Medric. We are away for a couple of pe months, and people are like, I'm just going to do the minimal here. I'm just this <laughs> one name <laughs> person. It was all these other florid descriptions <laughs> before. To be fair, I'm trying to set stuff up. My name is right there. Well. <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Well, uh, for those who don't remember what happened, uh, which includes myself somewhat, and, me. <laughs> uh, and also see if I can get the players back to uh, order, I want to thank uh, Pat. However, Pat is very diligent about creating summaries for each of the episodes and posting them on our Facebook group, Watchers of the Drowned Isles. And it was invaluable for me also trying to remember <laughs> what the heck was going on. Um, so if you're also similarly lost, uh, you can also watch the previous episodes on YouTube or on uh, Twitch as well. But uh, without further ado, let me see if I can piece it all together from memory. I may make a mistake or 17 throughout this process, but we'll see if we can put it together. Essentially, this is a time of uh, massive upheaval in the world of Omesha. A god has been removed from the world, which was also partially the plot of the first game, but we went back a thousand years to the very origins of that. And the goddess Paluxia uh, was removed from the world for reasons that aren't entirely clear. Bits and pieces of lore have, have emerged over time. Um, but it has led the world to be in somewhat of a shambles. And the player characters are living through that shambles, as well as having their own uh, worlds uh, up, up, upheaved, upheveled uh, uh, during all of what they're doing. Most recently, uh, we'll, since you guys were terse in your characters' descriptions, I'll add a little bit here. Silas Marsh is a, uh, a member of uh, the Marsh family. Um, some would call them a cult, others would call them devout, some would call them those strange people who live on the other side of the Cape, and they are actively working to bring their goddess into the world, um, not just as a remote presence, but actually as a physical one. Uh, Annie, sometimes to some people, known as Annalise, uh, is... Um, a traveler far away from home, the kingdom of Alaria, the seat of Alaria, uh, is where she hails from. Once known there as the Princess Annelise of the royal family, now known as simply Annie, and also even that has been called into question. As she discovered recently that one of her last experiences still in the homeland was apparently dying. Uh, something she had not remembered. And she discovered that either she's living as a ghost in someone else's body or another person has now become a ghost in her body. It's hard to say, but... I'm she, confused. She has <laughs> uh, an inbuilt companion, shall we say, in the name of Meredith, 
uh, who was discovered and revealed uh, a little more strongly in the previous episode. And Medric, loyal follower of the sun god Ignis, uh, has been trying to uh, find a life after a war that he cannot remember. A war that lasted, well, you're not exactly sure how long. The Great Confusion is a period of forgetfulness across the lands of Amatia. But from what you've learned, it may have been as long as 800 years of unrecorded history, forgotten in time. And during that, some major war was fought, although with whom and how it turned out, you're not exactly sure. Although, again, little hints have been dropped here and there. The three of you are in the process of trying, well, a couple of different things. The primary thing you're here to do, at least initially, is to rescue one of your friends, Melora, who was drawn through a portal that appeared in the town of Aelthvot, or the center of all of what's going on. Um, you discover that the portal drew her through to a place called the Shadow, uh, a realm which lives in the shadow of Omesha. Possibly a hell? It's a little bit undefined as to exactly the purpose of what this place is here. Having found a way to create portals, part of the research that Silas is doing, you are able to successfully breach the world and travel through. Finding this desolate and somewhat odd land... Uh, over which stands the mighty Paturo, a massive mountain-sized figure who gazes out across the land and stares through in white beams of attention, which pierce the very land of, uh, of the shadow into Omesha, searching for something, it would seem. Uh, with that as the backdrop and other portals appearing here and there, you ran into a uh, ally, I guess, who took you to meet others, Turns out that they had been some of the jailers that were involved in this particular space, but they made you a deal. In return, um, for well, both letting you go and giving you some assistance, they hoped that you would take on a mutual enemy of theirs, the Dream Taker. Uh, the Dream Taker uh, holds a very special item, which they would like to have, uh, the item called the Locus of Intent. Um, so, in pursuit of that, and because it, it is believed that Melora was taken by the Dream Taker, possibly transformed somewhat, one of the features of this place is that parts of your soul can become manifest in physical items called soul coins. Those soul coins can become a currency, bought, sold, and traded, stolen, and even destroyed. And it seems as though at least something of Melora's coins are now owned by the Dream Taker. In pursuit of that, you went looking for the Dream Taker's lair, or their home base, or whatever you want to call it in this particular place. The thing you found, uh, along with your, uh, your assistance uh, from Rodolfo, who later, after gaining a particular coin, turned into Philandrius, I believe is his name, I think uh, so, yeah. Pulling that out of nowhere. There we go. Philandrius. Uh, transforming from uh, a, uh, I believe he was a gnome before, and now he is a hobgoblin, to make things even more confusing about identities. I think identities. he was a dwarf. Was he a dwarf before? Mm -hmm. It could be. It's been a long time. Uh, and uh, with that companion, you find your way to something that definitely stands out on the horizon. A familiar tall building. It was the Baron's estate, uh, the Barony uh, homes, sitting in the middle of this vast, um, ruddy desert scape, essentially. You enter in, find some um, shadows within, all windows covered with mirrors, strange combinations of that, and come to sense that the people within, or those shadows within, are in fact people who may be dreaming or projected, or the memories of other people. It's never quite entirely settled. Moving through, you discover someone who looks to be the Baroness. And after some poking and prodding, and I believe some explosions, uh, you uh, reveal that she is, in fact, 
the dream taker, or rather, the dream taker is portraying themselves as her. Alongside her is a mostly familiar sight, Melora, although somewhat transformed. There is no sign of your one-time summoned companion, Graveler, except for a strange stone emblem around the neck of Melora, who is referred to by the Dreamtaker as Geoda now and seems to be under their thrall. After explosions and shadows disappearing, the world vanishes from sight and is replaced by a rockier region showing signs of ancient ruins built over what looks like a lava landscape, much broader, much more desolate. At the far end of this sits the Dreamtaker, now standing maybe 10, 12 feet tall, surrounded in a throne of stone which looks to be the upper torso of a gigantic figure with its arms outstretched. And so we return back to this area. Each of you were moved in this space as well and uh, find yourselves slightly separated with... uh, Actually, I think all three of you are separated um, with other creatures that seem to be um, surrounding or nearby you, threatening you. Some of which you'd encountered in, in more disguised form in the previous realm. As we begin, the voice of the Dreamtaker booms from their seat upon their throne. I have brought us here so you can do less damage. There were clients who were dispatched unceremoniously by your your actions. Maybe this place is more suitable to our discussions. You had, I think, marginally described to questions or answered to questions about what brought you here. But uh, please, if you have any memory about any specifics there, it's been a while and I've not reviewed that episode. My notes are specifically TSB to area, Devil's Geode. So that's much more information than what I have. <laughs> probably that's Geoda. Yep, is, probably. Is, uh, represented on the map here. Geoda in this transformed form, uh, that, that's true. I remember you actually faced Geoda uh, as uh, the stone coming from the amulet spread over her entire body, allowing her search such um, interesting tactics as essentially turning herself into a large stone and rolling at you, is what one of the things she had done before. Yeah, we had a bit of a fight. A little bit of a fight. Um, the... Um, so just to clarify on the map, Annie to the far west of the map stands before what was revealed to be some sort of, um, spined devilish creature. It would probably stand taller than you, but it's somewhat hunched (laughs) over and its legs are, are in a more crouching form most of the time. Next to, to Medrick are two, uh, People just uh, beside is Geoda, and to the right is another one of these spined creatures, although a little more beefy than spiny, a little thicker rather than uh, more sharp. That's off to the east of the map. Towards the south of the map uh, stands Silas, no one ne- directly next to them, and Philandrius over to the south uh, southwest of the map, in the far north of the map is where the dream taker sits on their throne. Um, Once more, the voice of the dream taker can be heard, booming and yet weirdly intimate, like a whisper that echoes. Um, Once more, I ask you, what is your purpose here? And what do you think mine is? 
Now, we're not in initiative necessarily, and it does look like the, the enemies that are nearby are not making aggressive moves. But you can certainly make up your mind whether you want to make aggressive moves or speak. I think your purpose is to pull people here and then consume them. We're here to rescue someone. You are not incorrect, but you are not right either. I offer peace. Peace of oblivion. To free those poor souls who have moved beyond mortality and yet are fettered by memory and by regret, by guilt. I remove those things and allow them to become their purest self, to be reborn in the next cycle of life. At least, that was my purpose. Now this place is corrupted. The Lord has lost his vision or seeks a new one. The Lord. Which Lord are you referring to? And while this this land seems self-contained, um, it does gesture upward, and you can see kind of beyond the vague nimbus that surrounds this area, the figure of Paturo, and it's still standing forward, kind of leaning on, on forward stones and gazing out with its... It's an uh, active vision, if you will. The Lord Puturo, of course, who runs this realm, who was tasked with the dead, but now seeks something else. And your world is falling into this one, creating a kind of chaos I do not like. Well, we could... How would we prevent our world from falling into this one. I mean, no offense, but I don't really like it. <laughs> you are not supposed to like it here. That would be wrong to like it here. You are meant to want to move on. But not everybody does soon enough. Your friend, for example, came here through... The unfortunate openings and fell victim. I have done what I could for her, as you can see. And standing next to you, Medric, you see Geoda slash Melora, um, almost hard to recognize through the skin of stone, which now in, in, in shrouds her, um, even including almost a, a helmet like uh, a covering. The single eye now on her forehead, although you can still see small uh, indentations where the other eyes would normally be. It is a strange combination of uh, Graveler and Melora. Both can be recognized like this is the, the, the cross child of both. But within that, there's a certain stance that's taken. Um, before, she had been able to speak and actually said... Um, that she regretted but could not stop what she was about to do. Now there is no speech, but there is a sort of dipping of the of the head, which indicates the the tear, if you will, uh, in her in her being at the moment. So you fused her with Graveler, uh, the rock construct, and is there a way to unfuse her? I did not do that. That was how I found her. I believe the rock creature sacrificed itself to keep her alive, noticing that she was broken. Not hmm. near death, but losing herself. She still lost some of herself, but... I think it's part of her now. All right. But you did put her under your control. It was safer that way. She would have caused all sorts of problems otherwise. 
Problems like what? Chaos. The infection which crosses across this land, the emergence of the plainer world into this one. There are people who can be molded, people who can be brought to disrupt all that we do here, and that would be unacceptable. I've worked too hard for this to be torn apart now. There are others who would seek to disrupt my work, too. No doubt you've met some of them. Oh, yeah. But, Tell uh, me, is your world suffering as mine is, beyond the occasional loss of a person or two? There are things trying to invade our world. We've stopped some of them. I'm sure there will be more. Mm. So, yeah, things are not going exactly great in our world either. I have had a sense of some of this. You see, not only people and material cross the plains now, but my currency does too. What, the soul coins? No, that is the currency of the land. My currency is of memories and of thoughts, especially the unconscious ones. My currency is dreams. Hence, what names have been given to me as the dream taker. You see, I see dreams of the living now, and they concern. Maybe that's how you can help me, if you will consent to this. If it would help you, too, I think. What do you guys think? I'll ask Annie and Silas, and Pelandrius, too. Sorry, what are we consenting to again? Uh, they haven't specified yet. Because <laughs> our main mission here is and to rescue Geoda. And why do you take the form of the Baroness? What have you with her? That is part of what I'm trying to understand. This person and others connected to them have crossed into my realms of dream. I wish to understand this invasion. Not <laughs> to think that I run dream, but it is my hunting ground, I guess you might say. So I'd wish to understand them, as all of my clients, what makes them happen and what makes them unmake. Also, there seem to be some reflection from all of you to that person. And I like reflections. They tell me something about both the perceived and the perceiver. As for what you can do, I am not mortal. I have never been mortal. Even long before this place was created, I was not mortal. I have struggled to understand at times. Most people's lives are simple. They are fettered by inane things that can be easily unmade. But these mortal dreams are more confusing to me. You could understand them for me. Perhaps unmake them, but I don't think that's within your abilities. But you could bring me back an emblem of them so that I may be able to better understand how to deal with this incursion. You do this for me, and I can help to release your friend from the hold the shadow has over her. Well, that seems like a decent deal. What do you guys think? So, I just want to make sure that I'm, I have a player I'm understanding 
So it's she the dream taker will help us uh, bring Geoda back if we bring something to her from I, I'm, I'm not understanding what it's um it's not entirely clear uh it it it's it suggests that um they want you to intervene in some dream interpretation possibly returning with some element of that dream that's a reasonable starter assumption so who's a dream it's not possible to say they are not dreams of individuals they are collective experiences centered but also intertwined seems confusing it is most of the time I have but individuals to deal with, and they're simpler. A dwarf who regrets not having paid off a debt. A gnome whose family never lived up to their expectations. Things like that can be easily dealt away with. Their minds eased. Even those who have committed worse crimes, that part can be taken out by force. But this... I do not wish to damage our realms any further. Despite what the Lord has done, I do not wish to oppose him. So go in, go in somebody's dream, collective dream, retrieve a thing, and come back and bring, and bring you the thing. But what yeah. is the thing? How dangerous is it going to be? It's all in your minds. It's all in their minds. So the answer is extraordinarily dangerous at times. But... Well, I've never died in a dream before. What could possibly go wrong? It would be interesting to see how your unmaking happens... But I do not wish it on you at this time. You will not die of physical death. But there are worse things. What's more, <laughs> you may find, as I have, that in dreams it is sometimes easier to ask the questions that you dare not speak in waking life. I'm trying to as, think of like what question Medrick could have to ask anybody. <laughs> as Annie was asking, what is it you want us to get? The exact form is changeable. But it should be something which indicates a core element of that experience. It should present itself as unusual to the circumstance as well. It will reveal itself to you, I think. But I can help you with that. I can loan you my locus of intent, which can shine down upon the solutions. And with that, they're holding up this enormous jeweled bottle that they had been dropping coins into before. And what so do we start? get out of this? I would They'll do... help us release... Uh... Oh. No, go ahead. If you've got the player answer, I'd rather hear that. <laughs> So so they'll help us release Geoda from whatever is going on. And hopefully we can introduce some stability between our worlds so that future problems like this do not arise. As you've said, this has been disruptive. Yeah. 
The less surprise so incursions into other realms, the better. So it would be something that would be unusual to the situation, but also integral to it? I believe so, yes. It takes a million different forms and derives from the experience itself. I once had the dream of a painter, and from that the brush was an obvious uh, choice. But it wasn't the brush, it was a feather. These things are up to interpretation. But the locust can identify it when it appears. So well, this bottle, do we just does it light up or something when we hold it next to whatever the object is? It can, if you prefer. And they reach out, and even despite the distance here, directly towards you, um, Medric, it's as though there's a forced false perspective. And they're really no more than two feet away. But you know, and from the perspective that, uh, that Annie would have, um, you can see that the figure stretches out uh, as if uh, uh, reaching across the entire land. But from Medric's perspective, it is as though they are just right there. And as they reach forward with this ginormous bottle, it transforms into a lantern. And now there are five jeweled faces on the, on the front of the lantern. They all seem to be the same uh, reddish color as which is predominant here. And they kind of hand out the lantern to you. Nice. Do not abuse its power. I think you'll find it a little bit much for your mortal minds. But if you do this in good faith, it should serve you. Nice. Thanks. Do you take the lantern? Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. It's surprisingly... Pardon? I won't use it yet, but I'll just hold it. Okay. It's surprisingly heavy, and the uh, handle is uh, a little thicker. Um, it's not just a wire. It's like a, a solid metal piece, and it's warm to the touch. Even to your hand, it's warm to the touch. It also seems to be proportional to you, where it, it should have been as tall as you when they handed it to you. Uh, again, this weird force perspective. As they shrink back into the, the throne... Um, Again, Annie, with your... I think you're the one who has, like, the passive perception of 20 now. Is it right? <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Um, you notice that as they shrink back, and again, there's been no no detailed face, just this, this sort of pure white, what looks to be almost a mask. You see the form um, shrink even further. And the, 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 um, the humanoid shape which was mostly just a, a blackness, seems to take on a ragged uh, kind of character. Um, it's almost as though, well, I'll let you make your own conclusions, although you can roll an insight if you like. I will, because my brain, it's like it's giving a part of itself is kind of where my brain is going. Um, an 11. Uh, yeah, you, you get the feeling like there was a lot of power in this and that the transfer was not so much of an object. Do we have a deal then? Sure. Yeah. Um, how fragile is this thing? And I'll refer to the uh, focus of intent or locus of intent. It can be broken. It would take effort. And with that, right. there's sort of a, a wave. And as the as the hand moves across your vision, it seems to obscure all in front of you. And the world vanishes to be replaced by another world. All is dark. It's not just you. Okay, I wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> All is dark. Um, and the world does not seem to exist anywhere around you, aside from the group of you that is there. Um, I think 
yeah, so you can't see anything. Um, even we the ground feels indistinct. You can feel like you're standing on something, but you look down and there's nothing there. It's as though it's almost out of habit that you feel like you're standing on something. Someone please roll me a d6. Dice roller. Oh, everything in roll 20 has changed. No. <laughs> Why? Much of it is better, I will say. Six. Six. Oh, yeah. Okay. The lantern begins to glow. Um, I should say it's six-sided, not five-sided. Uh, the lantern begins to glow in one particular um, light. And as you hold up it in front of you, it appears as though a hallway is in that direction. The hallway is of, of uh, simple wood. Um, looks like it's an uh, um, aged, well-worn pathway. Uh, and let's make sure I get my own map done correctly. Because Medrick like glows slightly, does that help at all? Or the glow does not seem to extend beyond you. Okay. Um, it is though there is nothing to be lit up. Uh, however, you find yourselves uh, well. You find that hallway in front of you. I'm assuming you're going to move your way down the hallway. I yeah, don't actually see a hallway here. You don't know. This is a descriptive thing, but uh, sure. I'll take the lead, but move cautiously. Okay. The hallway is narrow, but it admits for one person at a time to move through it. With only a few steps away, you find yourselves at a door. Seems like a simple wooden door. Simple handle. Doesn't seem to be locked. I'll open it slowly. Okay. I'm assuming if we're in a dream, it's not going to be trapped, but I could be wrong. <laughs> As you open the door, you find mm. yourself within a room. Explosion. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't see it on here, and I've got to figure out... Do you see anything yet? Yes. Uh, I see... Okay. I may have... Have... Wait. Ah, no. I got like a big to... rug thing and some... Yeah, I see sigils on the floor and... Pillars and stuff. Other rooms. Okay. I need to figure out... It's been a while. I decided to do a little dynamic light stuff for just cause, uh, and probably uh, shouldn't have been so um, quick to do so. Because despite the fact that my my eye is in there, I'm not sorry. Seeing, I had to sneeze. I'm not seeing anything. Does the eye have dark vision slash anything like that? <laughs> it has vision. Um, the uh, I'm just going to reload the page just in case. Uh, it may need to be controlled by somebody to be uh, do that. So I'm going to say controlled by all players. There we go. Yep. Oh, wow. I actually got the right answer the first time. Go figure. Hey. Um, so now all of you can move the eye. So if you move into a new area, please let me know. And yes, there is bleed because I didn't do full walls on these things. Um, so... You'll have vague, shadowy notions of what's around you. The room is not large. The room is, well, as you can see, five by five with five foot squares approximately. Um, it is well, well made. A, uh, the ground seems to be made of dirt. And into that dirt is a complicated sigil, which seems to be um, a combination of uh, stones and paint. Um... Someone roll me a two d six. I need each individual number separately. I roll roll a d six. I got a three on one. Okay. And doubles don't count, so if you do get a double, just re-roll. And the next one is four. Okay. As if walking from. Well, I'll call it off camera. Um, Enter stage left. Kind of, yeah, kind of walking into the scene. Let's see, it's those two. Um, in conversation, 
um, you see walking in um, two familiar figures. One, a uh, sprightly human male, a little taller than average height, who always seems to have a bit of a smile and a smirk at the same time, um, who you know as Dale Nest, and a dwarf who has a bit of a scowl most of the time, um, who you had seen as Jordy, remembering that both of them are part of the woodcutters and also possibly having worked with the diamond. The conversation is vague, and it almost feels like they're not answering each other. Um, who has the highest insight? I That might be me. I think My so. My character is like the opposite of me, IRL. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, so plus nine insight. Okay. The oh, way, yeah. <laughs> the way that they're talking to each other, it's almost as though this is a conversation they've had a thousand times before. It's one of those things where either they replayed it many times or the same sort of conversation has come up. It appears to be innocuous. It's something about uh, a new song that Dale has heard and is trying to practice, but Jordy is somewhat concerned about the lyrics as it has some disparaging things to say about dwarves. Mm -hmm. uh, but Dale is trying to convince him that it's really just a joke. And they walk into the area, kind of stand uh, where two of those circles are, and then the conversation kind of fades, and both of them seem to be lost in thought. From nowhere, Dale pulls a lute and starts to strum. The sounds are distant, um, as if underwater. And Jordy just seems to be looking up, his hand on his chin, contemplating things. Do they see us at all? I'm assuming no. They don't seem to register you, no. They don't even seem to register each other right now. What's Lantern doing? Lantern is still with the same focus light. Doesn't seem to be changing at all. I'll ask Annie and Silas or in their general in, in their general direction. Are we in their dream? I don't know. Not sure. If it is a group dream, then you know, it might be theirs or someone else's, but now we're looking for a thing. I mean, maybe we should explore more. I don't know if talking to them will get to it. We could try. Mm. And uh, do I recognize a sigil on the floor at all, or is it anything religious? Um, you can make me a religion roll. If you if someone wants to make an arcana roll, that's also appropriate. D20. Religion is int, right? Okay, so D20 plus two. 22, Arcana. Hey, not 20, so 22. And a 22 uh, religion. So, from two different perspectives. Um, beginning with uh, Medrick's point of view, looking at it. Uh, now, I don't think that Medrick was necessarily the most scholastic of, of trainees in, or initiates into the oh, no. Temple of Ignis. <laughs> um, but you did pay attention, and you learned what you needed to learn. And when you look at this, um, this is almost a textbook illustration of one of the um, one of the the sort of um, things to watch out for. It's not practiced within the Ignean Church because you have your own ways of communing with Ignis, um, generally by staring into fires, being on fire, lighting other people <laughs> on fire. Uh, but uh, uh, the the intent of something like this is a communing. It is intended to to um, to appeal to something extra planar, uh, most likely appealing to a being itself or a a uh, like a specific being. It's not just a general call. It is from the runes that are on the outside. Those are specific to a a uh, a particular target that's meant to be reached. Okay. Um, Can I figure out the target? Or have, uh, is, does this one seem familiar at all? Or? It doesn't seem familiar. Uh, well, I should say there's a nagging familiarity about it, but you're not quite sure what it is. And that's where I'll bring in um, Silas. From your perspective, Silas, um, it's more the runes that catch your eye, but also you've built structures like this. Um, this would have been the same sort of thing in a way to commune with the mother 
not this exact shape, but the intent is the same. Um, and from the runes on the outside, um, uh, between you, I, I'm assuming that it'll be some talk back and forth. Please yeah. tell me if this is all just in your heads and you're not saying anything to each other. But I'm assuming there's some some communication going on back and forth. I'll just mention that it's something to communicate with something extra planar, but I can't tell what. And, and I'm just letting the brains do the braining. <laughs> do the brining? Um, <laughs> the runes on the outside, um, they... In the research that you would have done to help with the cult to do this sort of extra planar communication, you would have come across some of these before. This is specifically to an entity um, known as the Lady of the Hunt. It has many other names, but that is one that stands out in your mind. The Lady of the Hunt, from legend, is an archfey. So this would be a circle to communicate with her? At the very least. Other things mm. can be achieved with that, but this is the that's the base intent. Hmm. I don't know if communicating with a powerful fae is in our best interests, to be honest. If they're standing in the circles, is that a part of the ritual? I mean, it could be. It's hard to say because they're not focusing on that themselves, but they are. They did specifically wander into those spots. Can I have someone roll two d six, please? Separately. Yeah, yeah. It's not the total I'm after. It's the two separate. It's one d six is a two, and the second one is three. Okay. What, what's the diamond doing in there, by the way? Uh, sorry, that's not actually supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> it's like is he spying on us uh that's he always funny. is always assume so <laughs> that's, that's kind of funny that's that was an actually that the curtain was showing there, nothing to see here the curtain is gone uh but, shadow but similarly um as he plucks away and you hear dale swear um he fades out of existence and leaving the sort of echo of the sound and in his place you see in a sort of lotus position, almost meditating with hands out in front, um, you see Veer, the elven druid that was part of that group. Eyes are closed in a meditative sort of way. And into her left hand flies a bird, at which point she opens up one of her eyes with an amused look. Hello, little one. So this may be the uh, the dream of the group of them, then. A collective dream, mm -hmm. maybe. Deer holds the bird close to her ear and nods as if answering or listening to its answer. Jordy takes a step towards Veer. They begin to talk. It, it is in weird snatches of conversation. It's never full sentences. It's never a full conversation. It feels, again, almost like you're overhearing something which is in shorthand, which has been said so many times that uh, the exact words don't even matter. It's the rhythm as much. Um, I will say, um, whoever has, uh, let's see, what would be appropriate skill for this one. Pitch me a skill for understanding the gist of the conversation without getting the complete conversation. I mean, that's probably going to be insight for the most part. Okay. I mean, it would depend on what the topic of the conversation is. Let me see if I have an exemplar character sheet I can use here. So I have all the skills in front of me, but insight getting is, talked at. insight is, uh, is, uh, not inappropriate. I could also see perception. Mm -hmm. I could see, 
uh, if you're purely passive, those work. But remember, you can be active in these scenes. Investigation, maybe? Investigation would work. Not that Medrick is good at investigating, but... How would you how would you initiate the investigation? What would you be doing that would make that different? Uh, <clears throat> trying to read their read their lips, maybe. That's more perception. Investigation is more either poking for clues or putting clues together. <clears throat> so far, you have an eleven of perception from. Uh, Silas? It, yeah, he doesn't really know this much, so... Can I do insight? You can try insight, yeah. I'll right. do perception as well, because that's the best one I have. A... Hey. Wow, there we go. We are perceptive and insightful. So I think that from, from what... Um, what Annie is doing is as much kind of finishing the sentences, following the patterns, watching the lips, hearing that there are words that are unspoken, but they still kind of mouth some of those words. And from Medrick's perspective, it's kind of taking that as one of the clues that you need to understand and then putting that together. And it seems to be a disagreement. It's a disagreement about the direction that the group should be going in, not the physical direction the philosophical direction. Veer is loyal to Gauld, but, if, but worried. Jordy, also loyal, um, is much more vehement about not getting distracted and feels that what Gauld is going on is a blind alley. The bird flies off of Veer's hand, flies towards you, Medric, mm -hmm. and at the last moment, veers away as if it senses you there. And speaking of Veer, Veer also looks up, <laughs> kind of seems to almost see you for a second, I'll and, look then back get, at her. and then get drawn back into the conversation. I'm going to go up to them and like wave a hand in between the two of them. Okay. They both look at you kind of distantly as if not really seeing you, but they did look at you. Okay. I'll ask them, can you guys hear me? Let's see. Veer would have a puzzled expression on her face. Um, and say, is someone there? And Jordy just kind of looks between her and vaguely where Annie is standing right beside him and vaguely at where Medrick is standing a pace or two back, as if trying to focus, uh, the wrinkled brow and kind of scrunched up eyes as if trying to see you. Somewhat. Wait, uh, so the, the sigil, you said it was dirt. Uh, stones, painted stones and uh, okay. on a dirt ground, on dirt floor. So I'll go outside of the sigil so I don't mess it up. Okay. Ah, no, go away. <laughs> Token settings. Okay. And I'll draw something in the dirt to not, like, not to break a sigil, but I'll just draw something in the dirt and say, yes. Drawing the word yes in the... Yeah. Okay. Did you see that? Um, as soon as you step outside the circle, Veer seems to look away from where you were and focus briefly on Annie and then turn back to Jordy. And then they kind of <laughs> resume their conversation as if nothing has ever happened. You look back down and there's nothing written in the dirt. Okay. Well, that didn't work. Somebody roll me 2d6, please. Mm. 
Here's a six and a four. Okay. Um, this time it's Jordy who, exasperated, sighs, turns, walks away, and fades out um, into the distance. And then Veer holds there for a moment, looks around, shakes her head, closes her eyes, goes back to her lotus position, and also vanishes. You hear the distant sound of uh, music being played as walking into the circle is, sorry, that shouldn't be there, wrong one, grab them in the dark. There we go. Uh, Dale, who wanders in on one side. And then from behind you all, um, kind of stepping around Silas. Actually, what is Silas's passive perception? Um, let's see. Fifteen. Fifteen? Okay. I'll come down to a roll then. Just kind of curious about what happens there. Somebody bumps into you. Uh. They kind of do, uh, as you feel someone brush past your... Uh, oops, the right window here, so I'm not typing anything there. Uh, as you feel someone brush past your shoulder and kind of sneaking into the circle, you see Sable. Uh, it does not appear that Dale has noticed... Uh, her until an uh, intense still it seems on that same song which has taken on more detail this melody is starting to play itself out and in fact Sable comes up with a rather childish uh, poke in the ribs and says boo which point Dale kind of curses a bit there's a string which gets uh, overly pulled not broken thankfully um, but he can't help but smile you shouldn't sneak up on people like that. It's <laughs> definitely not safe in our line of work. Yeah, line of work. That's a funny way to put it. Still. And she proceeds to ask him about the song that he's playing. It doesn't notice that it seemed like either one of them noticed you, Annie, when they came into the circle. They seem to be intent at the moment, maybe on each other. Sable, right. for memory, is the daughter of the Baron and Baroness. And just a remem a memory, Gald is the sibling of the, the Baron brother. or something like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The Baron's brother who Gald claims uh, in a former life, in a former uh, uh, occupation, uh, actually left Gald uh, marooned on an island. And Gald has not forgiven that but for whatever reason was unable to carry through at the party and actually attack his brother. Where do these people seem to be coming from when they... ...sail around the edge of the sigil. So when they pass into that, um, it, it's, it's less distinct than a, a simple curtain. It's more like there's a a gradual grayness that they pass through. But it seems as though, for whatever reason, this is a focus for them as they come in, both physically and uh, apparently intellectually as well. Dallas is going to try and open the door to the south. Okay. Um, these are actual uh, openable doors in uh, Roll20 as well. Mm -hmm. So you can go ahead just... and... Wondering, uh, does Sable know this group fairly well? Or so Sable Sable has been a part of this group for some time. Okay, um, that was one of the reasons you found out that she was part of it. She was actually with one of the um, the Diamond Group's uh, um, escapades, I guess you might say, and you discovered that she'd actually been sneaking out for a while and was. Partially rebellious teenager against the mm -hmm. Baron and Baroness, but also seemed to be somewhat drawn to this this group for one reason or another. You open the door. There's a small hallway beyond that door. Yeah, he'll uh, go down and open the other door. Okay. 
in a is a conversation between Sable and uh, Dale. Is that more clear than previous conversations people were having in this room? Maybe it might also be that that's the impression you're getting of it because you're now paying attention. Um, there, there's still large gaps in it as though they're saying things you're not hearing. Um, but that's as much about maybe the shorthand between people who know each other, or maybe this other thing where it's a conversation they've had before, so they don't need to spell out all the details. Um, in this particular case, actually, we also make an insight roll. Um, and as you enter into that room or you see beyond that room, uh, the room in sort of a reddish hue, there's a, a thick smell in the air of smoke and oil. The ground seems to be um, completely covered in, in rusting metal plates. And the center is some sort of strange dais with, uh, with large metallic uh, posts on the, each of the cardinal directions that seem to, seem to uh, uh, loom over that center part. And they seem almost to have some articulation to them as well. Um, for that insight roll, any any one of us or a Silas? Uh, Medric in particular. Okay. Because you're paying attention insight. to their conversation. Roll. Uh, wow. Wow. <laughs> all all the that twenties tonight. <laughs> Don't um, jinx it. <laughs> the other thing that you pick up on here, which you haven't really seen the two of them interact that much. You saw Dale probably the last time you saw Dale was actually at the party at the Baron's estate uh, where he had actually uh, masqueraded as one of the performers and was there mm -hmm. in the scene in the room. Um, Sable was also there, but you never saw the two of them directly interact. But now seeing it, uh, Dale has this sort of uh, world-wise uh, traveling bard kind of, uh, kind of sense to him. Uh, playful, always has a smile, is always accommodating. Uh, Sable is looking up to him and there's almost something more than just admiration. And you get the sense that, oh, she has a crush on him. Ooh. And that may or may not uh, be one of the reasons that she likes this group. That makes sense then. So I'm going to imitate her and go boop and poke her in the side. Okay, one second. Um, the door from this room that uh, that Silas disappeared through closes on its own after a few seconds. And as you take a few steps into that room, uh, Silas, that door also closes. You start to hear this distant sound of grinding metal, Silas. The uh -oh. others do not hear this. Um, make a... Make an attack roll. A simple, uh, actually, let's make it an athletics roll. It's a very low difficulty because she's not expecting it. Actually, make it with advantage for that reason. Um, mm. It won't be something you'll necessarily fail at, but it will it will change the impact quite literally. So just an athletics, you said? Yeah. Oh, also, uh, Medric, uh, Dale does not seem to be aware of this crush. <laughs> you get the feeling he's kind of in that performer mode. He always has this this uh, disposition going on. She may have mis, uh, misinterpreted that. Um, it's like the coffee shop person who says, dear, and sud suddenly they're flirting with you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it definitely one-sided, or at least Dale isn't acknowledging it overtly. Gotcha. Whether he's more aware of it internally, it's hard to say, but he does not seem to be responding in the same way. He's just responding the same way he was with Jordy, to be, to be really honest. Um, it's a little bit weird as you reach out to Sable to give that, uh, that uh, gentle little poke. And it's almost as though you feel like the distance is much larger than it should be from what you're viewing. Um, and there's a little bit of an uh, electric... Um, tingle as well on your hand as you reach out but you do make contact and uh sable looks up rather surprised and looks directly at you oh uh annie hi she looks a oh, you can't little see me 
a little embarrassed. Uh, Dale has kind of shifted attention, but his attention quickly goes back to the loot, and he starts to expand out the song. Uh, yeah, of course I can see you. <laughs> Why? Are you supposed to be invisible? We were trying to figure that out ourselves. Do you oh. see anybody else or just me? Do I? And you see her look at, at Dale. Well, Dale's right there, and it doesn't look like anybody else is around. Okay. I'm here, too. Doesn't seem to react. You're sort of just on the edge of the circle. Um, I'll step closer into the circle. As soon as you step into the circle, um, Sable smiles. Oh, hi. Hello. Okay. Did you have a title? I forget if you ever had a title. Uh, Phoenix Champion, but that was largely made up by Silas. Right. <laughs> well, she would she would kind of uh, uh, bow a little bit. It's the Phoenix Champion. It's good to see you. It's, and she looks very puzzled. It's been a while? Mm-hmm. I don't remember. Are you awake or are you sleeping? What kind of a question is that? And she kind of... Exactly what it is. Her eyes glaze over a little bit. I'm... I, I was... I was running down the alleyway and... and Getting away from the... Uh, I don't know. I'm here, I guess. Okay. Silas, one of the doors off to the west opens of its own accord. On the other side of the door, you see... Where are you? Oh, I'm going to go the way of the lair. Hmm. A hulking figure, skeletal, with uh, the sound of jangling metal. Uh, where did you go? That would be that guy. Um, seems to be hauling behind it uh, on the yeah. ground. Uh, what looks like some sort of large net into which you can see um, lo looks like a humanoid figure dragging it in towards the center. Does it seem to notice me? At first, no. Um, it gets another step in, just about to, looks like, haul that, that uh, body in a bag up onto the dais in the center. But then it looks up, and it seems to look directly at you. Hey. You're uh, not supposed to be here. You're right. I go out the door. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then close it. Leaves. Now, one thing I will say about this map. Um, there are long hallways that you'll find in this map. Silas just stepped into one of them. They are the same length as the short hallways. In other words, they are 10 feet long. But it's really hard to display a three-dimensional cube as a map without uh, uh, having, you know, some very clever geometry. So whenever you're moving through one of those hallways, just consider it to be 10 feet. Okay. Um, the door clicks behind you, um, and there's silence in the hallway. Um, I'm going to ask Sable for the date. Okay. It's no fair to pull that on the GM who has to go like, what the hell is the date? Uh... Well, because we've been in the shadow for, for a little bit now, and mm -hmm. I, not in this book, I'm trying to find the other, my other note, my old notebook, have the date of when we left noted. Right. I believe that was Yarrow the 11th when you left. Something like that. Um, so she kind of screws up her face at the question. Um, it's like the third of Axum? What a weird question. You don't know? 
I'm in a different plane right now. Is that... Is that code for something? No. Right, right now, for, for me, I, I left... It's just been a day. And it was like the 11th of Yarrow. Huh. Weird. Yeah. Weird. We think we're inside a dream right now. Um, okay. <laughs> if you say so. Um, maybe I'm dreaming. When she kind of looks over at Dale. Uh. Roll 2d6, please. There's a three and a five from Marie. Okay. At this point, um, Dale seems to have got most of the song worked out. It doesn't sound like one of the ones you've heard him play before, but you haven't heard him play a lot. It just kind of wanders away into the, the shadow and eventually uh, just disappears. And then... Sable looks over at him with some concern and I should go and chases after him in the same direction and similarly vanishes. All right, be safe. Um, that was weird. From the western side of the room, um, once more, Jordy walks into view, this time carrying uh, his massive axe. Um, looks like he's, he's uh, not dressed for battle so much as dressed for cutting trees. Uh, and you see him kind of uh, gesture to the other side of the room where you see uh, the towering figure of Marta walk into view. Uh, holding um, what looks like a saw. It looks like it's a saw meant for two people. <laughs> But for her, it seems a lot smaller than that. Um, and as she's kind of, they're kind of waving to each other. And as they both come into the center, they both kind of stop short on either side of Annie. Um, Marta looking down with some confusion to find you there. And Jordy, uh, with the scowl turning momentarily to a smile, um, Hello, didn't expect to find you in the woods. You're in the woods? Of course. I am actually a woodcutter. It's not the only thing I do, obviously, but... What's that sigil on the floor, then? Make a persuasion roll. Meanwhile, what's Silas getting up to? Silas is going to open the door behind him again and see if that thing is still there. Okay. It's moved to the other side of the dais. The body has been deposited in the center. And you can see those, those uh, large metal pillars starting to bend over the body, pulling apart the first the uh, bag that it was carrying, or the netting, really, uh, and then starting to, to stretch out the body. It looks like um, the body of... Do, do, do. Let's see, this one. Uh, make a make a memory roll of some kind. Um, if you have a skill, you have a skill in um, uh, water vehicles, yes? Yep. Okay. Make it with, uh, uh, with that, so you'll get a proficiency bonus. Um, it can be wisdom or intelligence, probably. Uh, unfortunately, not with advantage, but uh, seven. Um, you, you're looking at the, the body. You can see it's soaking wet. Um, you can see that there's, there's uh, tendrils of, of, uh, of seaweed wrapped around one of the legs. Um, the skin seems to be pale. Um, it looks like a, a, a man in his early 30s. Um, obviously dead, at least pretty obviously. Uh, obviously pulled out of water. He seems vaguely familiar, but you can't pin him. Um, the uh, 
the guard is standing there kind of watching the process, sees the door open, and looks over at you. And takes a step towards the door. When the arms are stretching the body out, are they just straightening the body up, or are they pulling the body apart? Um, just arranging it uh, in kind of a, a normal shape. So it's not just a jumble of... of uh, of a body, but actually stretched out as if it's a human being, um, or a humanoid being, I guess. Hmm. Okay. Silas is going to shut the door and move to the other room. <laughs> Make a dexterity saving throw. Uh-oh. Okay. So it's going to come down to a straight strength check. Um, you are able to get the door partially closed, but then the hand of this creature reaches out and pushes against the door. So it's going to be strength versus strength. Uh, athletics, if you have it, uh, they don't have athletics. So probably going to be pretty, that rolled twice. Why did that roll twice? Well, they're both better than a three. Mm -hmm. It's managed to hold the door open. Okay. Then Silas will just walk to the other door and open it. Okay. Um, uh, we'll get an opportunity attack. Uh, does not have its longsword drawn, so it won't be the longsword damage, just the regular strength roll. There's an 18 hit. I believe so. Where is that? Yep, 18 will just hit. Okay. Uh, what's that? Four. Oh, maxed out. Uh, eight slashing damage as its claw rakes across your back. Oh, jeez. That's unfriendly. but you are able to, to, to walk away. It does not seem to advance beyond the door. And then shortly after you step away, uh, the door, in fact, closes on its own. Um, back to the other room. With Jordy and Marta now standing other side of, of Annie. Um, you asked about the symbol. Um, Jordy looks down. It's just grass. How much you do you know? You were just talking know? with Dale. Probably. We talk all the time. Like minutes ago. Is he with you? I'm sure he's around here somewhere. What are you talking about with this symbol? Says Marta, sounding very suspicious. So right now, we're in a room. There is a symbol on the floor. The symbol to commune with something extra planar, I believe. And uh, mm -hmm. you guys keep popping in and out. It's like we're in somebody's dream. We're looking for something. We're not sure what. You are wrong. This is not a room. This is the woods. There is no symbol. And you are the one who's popped in. Can you see this lantern? I'll bring up the lantern. Uh, and both of them react to it, drawn almost by the light, it seems, and they go quiet for a second, as if lost in the light of the lantern itself. I'll uh, bring the lantern back down. <laughs> is there something wrong? Did something happen? That's what we're trying to figure out. It wasn't did us. You recognize, did you recognize that lantern? Mm, no. It was very bright. You can make an insight check. I most certainly will. Oh, my good rolls are over. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. 
<clears throat> they seem to be just generally confused with what the hell's going on here. As are we. <laughs> uh, back to Silas. You open the door to this other room, and it's a rather strangely laid out room. Um, the center of the room, you see a big uh, office table, or a big, sorry, a big desk is what I'm trying to say. Uh, behind it is a very luxurious chair. Ironically, you're one of the few people who would actually recognize this chair and this desk because you were in this room, well, not this one. It wasn't laid out like this, but you were in an office inside the Baron's uh, uh, estate where he had a very old, very large armchair there behind his desk. The far end of the room, however, is quite strange. And I'll see if I can give everybody at home some idea. I might have to, I wonder if I can copy that. I didn't expect the party to split quite so quickly, so I don't have <laughs> uh, more than one viewpoint here. This is Silas. He opens doors and wanders. He, he wanders <laughs> off. Yeah. He, he's, got, he's, got a little, uh, he's got a little problem where he wanders away. Um, the far corner of the room is, is lit by this bright sunlight that seems to, um, it seems to change angle from time to time. There are three windows, which I've kind of depicted on the outside of the walls here, but three, uh, stained glass windows, which, uh, are, are visible from that, uh, from that angle. I didn't get the angle right on one of them. I just realized it's upside down. Oh, well, uh, and from that, you can see kind of uh, the, the, uh, the sunlight streaming in with multiple patterns. In front of that window, incongruously with the rest of the shape of the, of the space, uh, is uh, a, uh, a large wheel, of a, a large ship's wheel. It seems to be tied down and not going in any particular direction. Off to the far left and far right, you can make out bookshelves. Um, but no one, uh, but the shelves, the books themselves seem to be vague, um, almost as though, um, whatever words are on them almost seem to swim before your eyes. Um, roll a D4, please. Okay. Um, entering through, let's see here. Uh, entering through the upper door without really seeming like they had to open it. They just sort of entered. Um, you see the um, large swaggering form of the captain of the guard, who you saw briefly inside the, uh, the Baron's estate. Um, if you recall, um, muscular human, um, bit of a, of a, of a scraggly beard, Looks as though he just hasn't shaved on a regular basis, really. Um, wearing very functional-looking armor. It's it's sort of official armor, but this is armor that's been lived in, worked in, sweated in, bled in. And while he'll wash it off from time to time, he clearly doesn't uh, 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 spit polish or anything like that. And he kind of walks in and has a seat at one of the stools. Um, in case I didn't indicate there are three stools that are gathered around the uh, desk as well. Mm. Um, kind of goes in, sits down, um, pulls out a knife and starts to sort of cut away at uh, overgrown nails and seems to be waiting for something. Doesn't seem to pay any attention to you being uh, on the threshold of the, of the room. Okay. Well, Silas is just going to quickly go to the other door over here okay. and go through it. Uh, the door closes behind you on the other side. You find yourself in a small hallway. And as you approach that door, that one closes behind you as well. And you see them standing in the room with, uh, well, actually, you see Marta, <laughs> who's rather tall and rather broad, uh, kind of taking up most of your vision. Um, Where did you go? <laughs> uh, to the south of us is a me rusted metal room with some sort of ghoul bringing in drowned bodies. And Lovely. I just came from a room that is kind of like a 
copy of the Baron's office, but not quite. Um, can I have the lamp? <laughs> yeah, sure. And there were no instructions or any need to do anything with the lamp. It lit up on its own. Mm. Who was Marta again? Like she's with the woodcutter's crew, I assume. Yeah, she's a rather yeah. tall. Um, basically, she's a barbarian, uh, tall Goliath type. Um, from, oh, man, I forget. It's from the same place that uh, Paul was from. I forget the name of the place right offhand. Um, yeah, the barbarian place. Yeah, well, yeah, essentially. They stand between the Yorkdana and the uh, the Emperor of the East, the Hobgoblin Empire, and yet they've never been conquered um, with those two forces. If there's nothing wrong, we have work to do, says Marta. And Jordy's like, it's nice to see you all, but she's right. All right, be safe. And they just sort of walk off into the distance. Silas would say, so what's going on here? Are they just dreaming and passing through? or They, they, were, they thought they were in the woods. I pointed at the sigil and he said it was just grass. Roll 2d6 for me, please. Hmm. Okay. Must be just dreaming then. Sorry, I had to go deal with the cat because she was growling in her sleep. <laughs> There's a three. <laughs> and a five. Three and a five. Just really have you roll before they leave. Uh, oh, actually, okay. Uh, in this particular case, they stop and start to chat uh, because it is them again. <laughs> so, yeah, on the edge of the circle, um, Marta and Jordy begin to chat once more. Um, they seem to be, okay, you know, in, in sort of professional, uh, woods person's lives, the comparison of your instruments, if you will, between his large ax and her broad, uh, saw, um, would probably be considered normal conversation. It's a little bit weird between the two of them as well. Um, they even swap, uh, uh, tools at one point and um, Marta's ha hefting this massive axe with one hand mm -hmm. um, which it did take Jordy two hands uh, and Jordy's kind of flexing this saw um, Medrick make an insight check if you're paying attention to them at all I totally am 14 so 23 23 uh, yeah um, you're not exactly sure because it's not within the realm of maybe your experience, but you think they're flirting. Or maybe they're having a competition. But it probably doesn't need this much time to actually um, compare instruments. Okay. So you said that you went south, but you came out of the not uh, door that wasn't south. So where else did you go? Uh, well, to the, uh, to the south, the, uh, the creature that came in, uh, felt I shouldn't be there and, uh, uh, Silas will show where, uh, he's got some claw, claw gashes. Uh, so I left that room, uh, heading west, uh, east and after a much shorter trip than I thought, thought ended up in the room just east of us here um, and I saw the head of the Baron's guard in there but he didn't seem to notice me before I walked through and left the room okay should we investigate that room next then um I mean, it's up to you guys. I'm just kind of wandering around trying to get a lay of the land. It looks like maybe we're separated into five rooms connected by short hallways. But there's also like an outer layer that 
Uh, there's an outer set of doors on each of these rooms, so there might be a hallway or something beyond that as well. Whatever we do, we should probably stay together from now on in case we run into any more hostiles. No. Exactly. So you said Let's... the door to the south has a creature in it. What about the one to the north? I haven't been there just to the south and the east. Well, let's go north then. Who has a lantern? Right, Silas does. Also, Mendrick, do you have any healing but per trance? I do. Because I'm at like just over half. Oh shit. Okay, because I, I saw your uh, your your thing says 76 out of 6. No, no, that's mine. Never mind. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> I thought your HP was my HP. <laughs> Nope. Right. Kind of hurting. Mm -hmm. I don't usually get injured. This is very out of character. As you're talking, Marta and Jordy vanish from that room. All right. Level one cure wounds on A. It's 1d8 plus my modifier, which is three. three. Max damage. Come on. Oh, five. God damn it. <laughs> Okay. Better than, you know, being at one HP from half. <laughs> yeah, that's not my best work. Would you like more? All or... good. Still feels better. All right. Let me know if anything happens. I think I found an electric pool. So um, as you open that door, um, again... Ironic enough that it's Silas that opens that door. In front of you is what feels like a rolling grass field. It no longer feels like floor at all. It feels like solid, the dirt underneath you. Um, not far away at the center of what looks to be an electrical storm, um, you see a, uh, a familiar sight. In the village, you have, not entirely unlike the sigil you just left there's a sort of center point which is used as a communion point with the mother mm -hmm. uh, it would have been a uh, fire pit sometimes it would have been a gathering point at other points it's sort of a, a communal center of the of the village and that is what you see on the ground in front of you but it is surrounded by a circular arc of electricity which is uh, moving off in all directions uh, sparking not not largely for the most part, most of the sparks are small little little juts out, but um, you sense that it's not electricity. <laughs> it is pure magical energy, which seems to be swirling around that. And uh, on opposite sides of the space, unaffected by the energy itself, you see two familiar figures. They seem to be mm -hmm. arguing. It's hard to tell from this distance what they're arguing about. You don't often hear Athanos speak up with an angry voice. He's very passive for the most part, very hardworking, very loyal, but seems to be disputing something. And based on the position they're in, you also kind of feel like that energy is swirling around and between them as well. Hmm. Says, watch out, this place could be very shocking. But it's... <laughs> what are they saying? Is... Hmm. Yeah, Silas is going to try and sneak close enough to listen. Okay. Are you actually trying to sneak, or...? I mean, he'll be just quietly moving. He's trying to be quiet, but it... yeah, uh, basically sneaking. the eyes in there now um, well you can roll a stealth roll if you'd like uh, at disadvantage as you get closer because the sparking of the lightning does uh, kind of make it a little bit unfriendly but 12 is the result regardless um, let's see what Athenos has for a result nope not plus 12 plus 2 um Yep, roll the six. So, too intent on the discussion. Um, from where you are, uh, Medric, you can't 
really hear anything. In fact, you can't even see into the room when you're in the hallway. Okay. Um, so you'll have to move a bit closer. The door has closed behind you, however. I'll move into the room. Okay. And not long after you step into the room, the door closes as well. And Medrick wonders, because there's a lightning room, he wonders, is there a fire room? Who knows? Um, you also get that sense, because you are a magic user, that it's not just purely electricity, but more magical energy is spinning in the area. Um, they don't seem to pay any attention to magic. I or keep Annie. my distance. Yeah, and, <laughs> me too. And from where you are, you really can't hear anything of the conversation. You get the tone of the conversation, as in an argument, but not really getting to the words. As you move a little bit closer, um, and you find yourself having to move even a little bit more closer to pretty much the other side of that door, um, or in front of the door, um, Silas, before you really hear anything of detail. Um, I'm not going to go word by word, but, and you hear more of Athanos's side of it than you do of Od Odega's. Um, her answers are kind of obscured to you from this distance, but it's, it's as though Athanos is not happy with the plan and you know what plan this is. You know exactly what the goal is for the, for the two of them. Um, he argues that the cost is too high. No matter what she tells us, the cost is too high. I won't do it again. You'll have to find someone else. And again, there feels like part of the conversation is missing, as though they've had this argument before. He's already had the argument in his head, perhaps. And doesn't need to articulate everything directly. But again, they do respond to you. Well, Silas is going to walk closer and try not to get shocked, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, ask Athenos, what is the problem? So as you move through this field of energy, you do get hit by it, but it does not feel to you like any painful experience. Definitely not the shock like, like lightning is. Instead, it's more like, it's more like a gentle caress. It's more like you feel in that moment the presence of the mother reaching out to you and trying to grab hold and not finding enough to purchase on. And that's when you kind of realize that that may in fact be the tendrils of the mother's influence, that that is the, a, a representation of how far she's come so far and yet how far away she still is. Hmm. Uh, Athenos whirls at your voice uh, and looks at you and you make an insight check right away as his expression changes. Uh, nope. <laughs> There's something, but it's gone in a fleeting instant. Uh, back to the, the, the sort of relaxed, um, slightly bitter with the world, uh, stone-faced, uh, uh, I'm a fisherman, have been a fisherman for 60 years. I've got, you know, calluses on my calluses kind of, kind of expression where it just kind of flattens out and deadens. You've got your own problems to deal with. You don't need mine. Uh, given that this kind of feels like the mother and not like lightning lashing around, uh, unless there's a fire there, Silas is going to go right into the middle and ask both of them what's up. Okay. There is no, no, uh, no fire and, and no pain. And it feels more and more like this power is flowing through you, flowing out to every single pore, flowing through your heart and through your, your lungs. Uh, every bone feels like it's lifted. Uh, all your skin has this wonderful sensation of being held. And for a moment, um, you're probably lost in that feeling a little bit um, as the rest of the world seems to fade away. And you can mm. almost, but not quite, hear the mother's voice. Um, calling out to you, but it's, there's nothing quite distinct and it's, it's like a hum heard, uh, through a storm. 
Um, but Athanos kind of follows you as you walk around him. Odega looks up, and uh, a look of, of, of concern, and then a, um, an immediate transformation into a smile of, of control, of power, of, um, of, of motherly power in many ways. Um, she's put on the elder mask, if you will. Um, it's good to see you, child. What is going so, on here? Oh, sorry. J- j- just a question mm-hmm. for context. Um, are we able to hear Silas, but not really Odega and Athanos clearly? You could hear Silas until he stepped in the center of the circle, and then there's just too much background noise, essentially. From where you are, you don't feel like you're going to be able to engage with the conversation. You're not sure. He does not seem harmed by it at all. In fact, if anything, it almost as though the the, the lightning or the energy moves around and uh, fits him like a, a, a glove or a cloak. I will stay where I am for now. Yeah, okay. same. I'm a little I might weird. move a little bit closer, though. Oops, I'm a little weirded out by the double eyes being right there, so I'm going to move one up there. It's probably even weirder. <laughs> okay. Now it looks like the face is lopsided. <laughs> <laughs> you put them I both mean, at the top, I'll though. put them both at the top, and then we'll, we'll be completely confused <laughs> as, as, as uh, Silas is now the nose. <laughs> um, and Odega and uh, Athenos are now the nostrils. Um, uh, so you step a bit further forward. Um Two things for you, uh, Medric. Make mm-hmm. an Arcana or Religion roll, uh, uh, and make religion a de- because and make a Dexterity hard. saving throw. Uh-oh. Religion roll is a fifteen. Okay. Dex save is a two. <laughs> okay. So I probably trip over something. So as you as you move forward into this. Um, You've had some experience with lightning. You've been struck by lightning, I think, a couple of times, or lightning bolts or things like that. Oh, probably. Um, this does not behave in that way at all. Um, and you are able to kind of sense this almost sentience within this space. Um, it does kind of reach out and touch you, uh, and you're not able to flinch back fast enough. But it didn't hurt so much as it was surprising. And as you eventually flinched back, it did as well and kind of carves out some space around you, not wanting to come closer. You okay. get the sense both of it not wanting to hurt you, but also not really that interested in you. Okay. I'll just um, back away just in case. Okay. All right. All right. And the, the flow kind of continues, um, snapping out a little bit. And you're staying where you are, Annie. No, no, not moving towards the lightning. Move, yep. Move into the, the lightning. It's magic. I'm staying far from it. That's fair. That is that is very much on brand. It's like sentient lightning. It didn't hurt though. It's like I was interested in me, and I don't know. I guess I thought it thought I thought I was boring. It seems interested in Silas. And to be clear, Medric and Annie can hear each other quite fine, and Silas can hear the two of them quite fine, but can't really be heard uh, by them um, from where he is, in the center of the vortex. Shouldn't you be doing something important? Says Athanos. <laughs> Jeez. I see a discussion between the elders of the clan who seem to disagree about something. I figure maybe I should take an interest. Oh, it's nothing that concerns you, dear. It's just old people getting... Uh, disputes about how history has gone, really. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, So, Athenos, do you feel that the direction we are going in is wrong? It's, um... It's not my place to question the mother's teachings. Of course it is. You're one of the elders. If you think that we are doing this incorrectly, then of course you should speak up. 
The fault does not lie with the mother, simply Athanos misunderstanding his role and all of our roles in these things. I've been trying to patiently explain, but I've been trying to patiently explain things from him for, uh, to him for over 30 years now. Sometimes it takes a little more force than other times. I'm just being stubborn. I don't know if you feel there's something wrong with your position in things or your duties. And I mean, certainly you should bring this up. All of you can make insight checks. I will say for Annie, it is at disadvantage because of the obscurement and the distance. Oh, 17. Is that me too, me as well or the yep. two of them? No, uh, okay. Silas can make it as well. There be drama. Okay. Mm. All right. Starting with the furthest away and the lowest roll, coincidentally. Um, Annie, you can see the tension in Athanos. Um, clearly, there's something wrong with with him, but there's a lot riding on, from what you understand of the, of the Marsh's, uh, uh, plans. Um, it's, it's no small feat to try to bring and manifest your goddess into the world. Um, and it must be challenging. You also know the general attitude towards the Marshes isn't always the best. And Athenos is not one of the people who would ingratiate himself with anyone. So there's probably tension there too. For, um, Silas, um, you also pick up on that tension. You pick up on the fact that Athanos um, keeps looking over your shoulder at Odiga whenever you ask him a question. And for Medric, you further pick up not only on that sort of gesture, but there is a physical manifestation of his desire to say something, which he is actively tamping down. There's something he wants to say. He does not want to say it. And it's not just Odiga which is stopping him from saying it. So he's being like magically silenced. You can't talk about certain things. Whether it's magical or whether it's internal, you can't really tell. I'll make a I'll make a note to mention that to Silas after he leaves the circle. Okay. Well, Silas will bring up the lantern where he is and see if anything happens. Okay. One thing you will notice is that a different facet of the lantern is lit up. They're more or less remarkably identical, but there's little little elements which uh, allow you to tell one side from another. Um, essentially, the numbering scheme, if you will. So a different a different one does light up in this case. Um, let's scroll to that one there. Um, the lantern seems to, where are we here? Where do you shine the lantern? It is a, it is a, a, a directed light. So it is something which has a specific beam of light going out. I mean, he, he kind of just lifts it up in front of him, but he'll maybe kind of aim it at the the uh, the pit. Okay. Or the lightning that uh, the the energy that's flowing around them. Okay. Um. In glimpses in the lightning itself, while it only seems to be singular strands of power which are floating around you the lantern seems to catch, almost in a strobe-like effect, glimpses of the mother herself, standing there um, just for an instant and then vanishing, standing in another position, another space, and vanishing. Um, momentary glimpses of her manifestation, perhaps. Um, it's, it's there and almost before you're able to really fully recognize it gone. Um, you've seen different faces of the mother as well. Um, this seems to be the the most humanoid of the face of the mother. 
um, the one that's generally the, the most uh, iconographic, the one that's usually described um, as the, the sort of the stately form, um, taller than most uh, humans, uh, dark green skin, um, scales as well. Um, but you've seen a more monstrous form of that before as well. That's not being on display here. Um, when you lean it over the pit and see kind of the edge of that, um, you, something shines, a, a, a glimpse, a, a glint in the light of the lantern. But it seems to shine beyond the pit itself. You easily can put your foot down and you feel the surface of the pit, um, nothing more than, than a bit of burned ground and ash, the remnants of fires and, and other celebrations. But somehow beyond that, beyond the physical nature of that, um, there is something which catches the eye. But in that instant, you feel, you feel almost as though it is pushed away from your vision, in part by the power which flows around the two of them. He'll shine it at Odiga. Okay. And ask her if she recognizes what this is. Hmm. Okay. Um, are you putting any force behind the question? Not really. It's more just covering why he's pointing it at her. Hmm. Okay. I'll have to think about that for a second. Um, that particular reaction. I just want to see if I have that. Um, okay. Right. Okay. Uh, There's a look that crosses across Odiga's face for an instant. Um, once again, I'll have everybody make a insight check. This time, both Medric and Annie, however, are at disadvantage because it's the other side of the room, um, kind of a, a, a bit away. Okay. It was 21 and a 27, so I guess wow. 21 is a disadvantage. Wow. <laughs> Eagle-eyed Medric over here. Okay. Mm -hmm. See, I can see things... He gets the details. It's true. Um, and perhaps it's because you're too close to the matter, um, Silas. There is something that crosses across your face. You're also very familiar with the kind of mask that she drops into into mode. Um, and that served the, the family very, very well many, many times, uh, where, you know, there's discord among, say, the younger uh, members of the clan who are eager to go off and leave the clan behind to forget all the stuff they've worked for, the family's worked for, for generations. Uh, and she's able to rein them in, to, to, to bring them back to the fold. Um, and at other times, it's been very, very effective at dealing with outsiders in the face of, of terrible um, uh, accusations and, and worse, uh, Odega has remained uh, firm and steady and steadfast. And that kind of is the mask that drops into place, um, as this goes over. Um, but there is a smile. Um, I see it as, I see it as a sign, a glimpse of, of higher power for, um, Annie, you notice a little flinch when the lantern comes up. And it's a flinch which is not physically repulsed by it. It's more like if she saw an image that, um, that disturbed her greatly. And you see the, the mask fall into place, but um, you've seen the, the area, the, the edge of the mask, if you will. She saw something she did not, uh, did not like. Something that she she did not want to see. <clears throat> For 
for Medric, you see that. You also see something really unexpected. Mm -hmm. In its regret, sadness, and there's a flicker of the eyes as she looks over at Athanos, and beyond him, you notice, and at what point they appeared, you're not sure, but standing in the corner, I'll move the eye out of the way, is the figure of Wish. Aloysius. Um, this would be Silas's uh, father-in-law, the father of Molly, the uh, blacksmith who actually made your armor as well. Yep. Standing there stuff. kind of looking at this whole proceeding, and he's not looking as if he's really comprehending this. The look on his face is more of determination, resignation, uh, acceptance, perhaps. And Odiga's eyes flicker over him as well. They go harder when she looks at him than when she looked at Athanos. All that happens in the, in the blink of, a, of an eye, essentially. A blink of a, well, I guess a couple of blinks of eyes, <laughs> if you will. So nothing happens with the lantern itself in any way that would be obvious as to us finding something other than possibly that glint down below. Nothing when you aim it at, uh, at Odega. It doesn't seem to reveal anything different there. Um, yeah. I'm going to step forward. Okay. To, to here. Okay. Dexterity saving throw. Kind of expected that to be the the result. Uh, you uh, you step into the, the 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 lightning and kind of are maneuvering yourself carefully into it. You feel the surface of your skin, the the hairs on the on the back of your arm, um, standing up um, partially out of just the raw energy. You're quite sure it's not electricity now, um, up this close. It doesn't behave the same way. For one thing, it seems to behave almost intelligently, moving around you, kind of swirling almost. You feel it kind of touch at numerous little points across your body, almost mm -hmm. like someone uh, poking at your shoulder, then taps you on the forehead, then uh, uh, on, the, on the elbow, just little, little probes as they kind of swirl around you. And then... Um, you hear within you uh, the growing familiar voice of Meredith as while you were able to not react, she seems to have gotten tickled uh, and seems to giggle a little bit nervously. That, that's what, I don't understand any of this. But it doesn't seem to harm you. And you would have also noticed Wish now in the corner if you hadn't already paid attention. You see him standing there. Again, not really as much reacting to what's going on as just a look of resignation to what he sees. And what did you see that bothered you? Saying that to Odega? Odega. Um, she turns to you and, and the broad smile, placating smile comes across her face. Why would you think that anything bothered me? The world is difficult sometimes, that's all. And while I don't necessarily like to have arguments with my husband, they happen. You'll understand when you're older. <clears throat> you reacted, though, when you, when you looked at the lantern. As if you saw something that you did not want to see. It's a lantern. Yeah. It, what, what would, what else would res, what require that type of reaction? So, what did you see? Yeah, I noticed that too. So it's feeling like you're pushing a little bit. Um, yep. For that, I will say a role would be appropriate. You can say intimidation or persuasion, uh, those sorts of roles. Or if you have another one in mind, then I'm certainly open to hearing about it. 
Uh, I'll go with persuasion. Okay. Basically, I'm, like, I'm not trying to, to scare. <laughs> I'm trying to... Understand. Uh, uh, the... un understand, but persuade to to give the information. Because yeah. something, something is fishy. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, you are very nice. persuasive. Um, she looks at you and the smile falters for a second. Um, and then it, there's a, it, it, it turns more to a little bit of tinge of sadness or regret. My dear, perhaps you don't understand what it means to have to lead a people into difficult times and to be forced to take on challenges that you did not expect to do. Maybe someday... I understand more than you think. Maybe so. Our path has not been an easy one. The glory of our goddess has called to us for most of our lives. And we find ourselves on the threshold of making that possible. But there are still difficult things that need to be done. Some, some people stand in the way of that. Others find the duties to be too difficult and must be reasserted in their, in their importance. You're too young and not had to have any position of leadership or, or control over others, so you... While you say you understand, I'm sure maybe in time you will come to understand it more, but let us just say that I've had to do things which, while I do not regret, for they, they further the needs of the clan, are still difficult and will probably cause some haunting for my entire life. And what one of those memories did you just see? There's a pause as she considers her answer. And she looks over at Silas, and then beyond him to wish. Certain sacrifices have to be made for the greater good. It is not my place to choose them, but it is my choice to make them happen. Wait, so who got sacrificed? Doesn't really hear you from that distance, or maybe just ignoring you. Do I realize that she looked at Wish when she said that? I think you would have seen the, the glance towards Silas and towards Wish. She did not glance at Athenos until afterwards. Silas just mouths the name Molly. Oh. So you sacrificed Molly. This is not a matter to be spoken outside of the clan. Frankly, this is not the business of outsiders. And she turns to leave. Are you going to intervene or just let her go? You have an attack of opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look at Silas. Um, Silas just looks back with resignation as though it's, I mean, he's, he's often somewhat certain that this is kind of how it happened, but, uh, he does look, um, he definitely looks more tense. Uh, when he's looking at Odega. 
because his question was uh, was well, was more uh, did the mother do it but perhaps now the mother wasn't the one that did it per se what I'll say as she's walking away is that sa sacrificing the lives of, of one that you lead should be the last thing that you do she looks the over last option she looks over her shoulder at you before you do it yourself she looks over her shoulder at you and the the smile returns but mildly um, not as in a happy smile but more of a resolved smile um, and she she nods her head slightly It was. And then she fades away. On the other side of the room, well, Wish steps up beside Athanas. And you hear him quite clearly. And especially for Silas, Something has changed between the two men. They don't look like they do right now. They look like... Well, let me ask you. How long has it been since Molly's death? Um, a year or two, I think. Okay. For... This moment between the two of them, their, their bodies physically change. And you kind of realize that both men have aged significantly over that last year. And it's like all of that is drawn away. And you can see the pained look on Wish's face as he asks Athenos, What can you tell me? What, what can you say? What happened? And Athanos sighs deeply. It was an accident. They happen at sea sometimes. There was nothing I could do to stop it. Could I insight check that? Sure can. Yeah, I'm going to insight check that, yeah. too. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like a lie. <laughs> oh, wow. Another nat 20. Holy crap. <laughs> it's rocking the insight. Yeah, really. Uh, and that was a 13 from you uh, uh, for Silas? Okay, well, yep. I think the, the 29. Yeesh. Okay. Uh, so we'll go in reverse order as usual. Um, for silas first this close to the two of them first it hurts a lot to see wish this way you know that wish loved his daughter tremendously the two of you never really got along and in the last year um he's been very cold to you for the most part um maybe warming up a little bit but this is all of that stripped away to that moment of pain when he first learned that his daughter had gone missing um, and that, that is all kind of overwhelming in the moment to see that all again and to realize how much he's been probably bottling up since that happened, uh, you know, over a year ago. Um, for Athanos, um, it is that, that simple mask is returned, that mask of the hardworking fisherman who just puts one foot in front of the other, puts the meal on the table, gets work done, and kind of does seem to feel sad about this, but also this is the kind of thing that happens. And you've known in different fishing conditions and people haven't come back. It has happened before. Um, a boat might sink. There might be an, a, a creature uh, that attacks. That sort of thing does happen. Uh, obviously, it means a lot more when it happens to you and, and to your wife. Um, next out, we have uh, Annie standing right there. And you're not really seeing the front of Athenos at this point because they're facing away from you. You're seeing, again, that, that, that face of, of Wish. And it probably hurts a lot to see that because you did not see that the first time. So for you, this is a new experience and kind of recognizing that, you know, how much he lost at that moment. Um, 
and there's a sagging of the shoulders from Athanos. And it's not just sadness. There is a bit of resolution in it. Uh, as in, this is what I must say. I cannot offer him anything else other than this. For Medric, mm -hmm. the signals are more subtle. There is a, a rocking back on the heels from uh, Athanos as he's faced with a fuel, full fury and the brunt of, of Wish's complaint. There is a, a physical shift in the body. It is not as though um, he has taken a blow. It is as though he's just added a hundred ton weight onto his shoulders. His whole body, in your vision, sinks down with the weight that he's carrying. A weight that, for an instant, before he answers, you feel like he wants to throw that weight off. Like he doesn't want to carry it anymore. And then it settles in. And then he answers. He truly believes in what he said, that he did not have a choice. He does not believe that he couldn't have done something different. He believes that he must not have done something different, that he was not permitted to do something different. But he definitely knows exactly what happened and definitely knows that he is probably culpable for that. It's not exactly a full admission of guilt. But it's really close. And the two men fade away. I don't know if you guys saw that, but uh, Athenos knows what happened. I'm sorry, Silas. I know you've been looking for answers. But I th I'm pretty sure, sure that Molly's death is on their hands. Mm-hmm. Um, see, Silas's eyes, like, sharpen or almost glare a little when you say Molly's death, but, um, I think if they you are... Watch, when, when we get back to your village, I can use the power of Ignis to force the truth out of him, if that's okay with you. Hmm. I think the truth is more or less known. I don't believe Molly is dead. But that is neither here nor there now. Uh, Silas looks... Oh, Wish is already gone. Oh, okay. Yeah, the two of them went away after that confrontation. We must find what we're here for. Yes. Annie, at that point, you see a glint of something silverish around Silas's feet. I reach down to pick it up. It appears to be a silver pendant. It is a cast silver. Looks like a pair of um, seashells kind of cupped almost like hands. It's very delicate. Yeah, I, hmm? I thought that was something that was under the ground. Okay. It was. Ah. But things have been revealed. Um, as you pick it up, um, first off, Silas, you recognize this directly. This was a pendant that Molly always wore that was made by her father. It was made by Wish. Uh, she never took it off. In the light of the lamp, it glows a brilliant white. That was, that was Molly's. The lantern's glowing. Do you think that's one of the objects we need? Or the object we need? I think so. I mean, maybe there's one for each situation. I don't know, but this... One for each room, maybe. She maybe never took each this room off. has something to do 
with what's going on. So it might be a good idea to confront the situations in the other rooms more deeply. Mm -hmm. Silas is, uh, yes, uh, may I? And he reaches out for the necklace. I give it. This looks at his hands for a while. Then he, uh, he'll put it on over his own neck. Says we, we should look at the, the other room. I don't know if it's the last room, but. Well, you mentioned there was a creature that attacked you in one room, so that one's that one would be easy to take care of. Well, in depending terms, on, on in what terms of confrontations, that is, but. Yeah, we haven't checked either of the rooms with the lantern. Uh, there's the Baron's root office. There's whatever this room with the creature is. And there's this room that's to our west now that we don't know what it is. And maybe the middle room has something. And from, the west, then. from high above you. You can hear the booming voice of the dream taker. And when you look up, you see the moon-like uh, mask uh, hovering far above like it's a giant peering into a toy box. <laughs> I see you begin to understand. It's difficult. All these mortal feelings and complications that are hard to unravel. But I believe in you. Thanks, man. <laughs> so we need to confront the situations. Mm. Silas is just going to kind of squash that deep down inside and walk to the next door. Okay. Well, next door is a bit of a arbitrary yeah. measure. <laughs> <laughs> yep. West door. Well, the next one door. from his perspective. He's seen all the other ones. The west door. That's true. Well, no, you haven't seen the north door. Oh, but, well, yeah. Um, and there is a diminishing of that electrical effect. That's part of the map, so I can't remove it from there. But yeah, yeah. there's a diminishing of that magical effect in that room, uh, almost as though the collective effort by the people who were dreaming no longer are supporting it. Uh, once again, it appears to be a long hallway, but as soon as you step into it, it appears it turns into only 10 feet long and then confronts another door. So we're going down this door? That's where, yeah, that's where Silas heads. He's just kind of moving onwards quickly. And I wish he'd stop doing that, and I'll follow him. <laughs> and ju just to confirm, Mark, in the, like, in world, these are straight, just straight lines, right? They're not curved? So, um, Silas kind of moved through them quickly, and for him, it was always a straight line. But there there is a sense of... With, with kind of your heightened senses, you feel almost like you're walking around the outside of a cube. So we've so, only been in, if, if I have the vibe of a cube, we've only been in four rooms. There should be six. Um, you guys have only been in three rooms. Silas has been in four up to yeah, this two. point. Yeah, yeah. Um, you open this room and it's a little alarming because as soon as the door opens, you are you see water flowing outward. Um, there seems to be about two or three inches worth of water on the floor. But even as it starts to flow outward from the door, it only flows for a few inches and then stops. Um, almost like the door has, uh, is, on, is, is a beach and somehow this is lower within. Um, the water within does not seem to diminish at all. You see uh, in the room what looked like four collapsed pillars um, in sort of four sections or four even spots within the room. The room itself is flooded. And a figure is bent over one of the pillars. And you can hear the minute sounds of, what, uh, of, of a hammer and a chisel beating away on stone. The figure, from what you can see, you can't see any details, but you can see that they're dressed entirely in white and seem to be bent over a task, slightly muttering to themselves. Do we recognize the figure? I mean, I, I see his name on the screen, but 
<laughs> Unless you actually enter the room. Like, you guys are just sort of standing in the hallway yeah. going, yep, that's yep. what it looks like. But from Silence here... Walk in. The other The other thing is that the perception is the further you go down the hallway, the less you actually see in the room, much more quickly than would normally be the case. So it's almost like it's obscured in fog. Um, but as you move in, um, Silas, um, you do make out the familiar figure of Tassar. Tassar was the... Uh, the man in white, who at first you had seen just sort of moving around the disaster zones of the uh, town after it was attacked by the Athlonian. Later on, you confronted or kind of teamed up with him um, as you discovered he was working alongside Cathron to remove elements of, of the dead god from the world. Um, he seemed to be quite sure of himself, also was aware of and actually owned one of the books of the Argenti Sagax, and was one of the reasons that you were able to start your journey through extraplanar uh, areas is that he actually opened up and helped open up the initial uh, segment. But what you see before you, uh, he was not a young man then, uh, but what you see before you is almost a much older man. Um, looks to be decades, if not more older. Hands are gnarled and twisted and wrinkled. The, the posture is, is bound up and twisted over. And he seems to have a tiny little chisel and a tiny little hammer, and he's hammering away at these uh, these alabaster uh, uh, broken pillars. And seems to be having no no. Hmm. Size is going to say, Tassar, what are you doing? The door closes behind you. Silas doesn't have a positive impression of Tazar. Uh, all my eyeballs just got locked out of the room. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> I like um, that picture of the map person. You... <laughs> yeah. Uh, I need a map minion. Someone to just update the movement of the eyes. Anyway. I, I don't mind mind doing that. Okay. I think but everybody. I, I, I think he is, he's referring to the, the picture that I sent in our group chat. Oh, sorry. I can't. I can't look at everyone at once. Unfortunately, I will check that out. Um, it is a masterpiece. It belongs in a museum. Face. <laughs> there we go. It's the, we'll have to post that. Uh, post that in the Facebook group for people to take a look at. Uh, I will. Um, yeah. Hey, the eyes make sense to me. <laughs> they just do lead to rather ridiculous situations. Uh, Tassar uh, kind of looks up to your accusation. Um, and you can see this, the sort of deep lines on his face, his, his cheeks are very sallow. His, uh, his, uh, hair is, is thinning. He looks decades older than when you last saw him. Um, and, uh, his voice is, is weak and reedy. I have to keep working. I must complete the work. I can't let the world stop. Mustn't let it stop. Must find. Must find. And kind of drifts off and goes back to work. Each of you notice that the water has risen by about six inches in the few seconds you've been in here. Must find what? Mm, lost. Can't find them. Can't find who. And kind of looks over and whirls over and, and sees you, but kind of these roomy eyes, you can see almost almost white across the eyes as if they're they're going blind. And don't uh, remember. I've had to destroy so much. I haven't mm, lost them a while ago. Lost what? Uh, agent of our work. Namazani's agent. As am I. Did I lose myself? Maybe I've lost myself. I think you might be dreaming. You said you're an, an agent of Namazani? At the mention of dreaming, there's a sort of look of shrewdness that crosses across his eyes as if he's kind of looking around and trying to re-understand everything and reinterpret everything. 
Who are you? You look familiar. I'm Medric. We met in uh, Elthvater. And I'll, I'll briefly describe the circumstances in, under which we met. Yes, yes, yes. You I remember. Like portal. I remember you too. But you all... That was a long time ago, wasn't it? What's the day? What's the that date today? today. <laughs> I don't know what day it is. What year then? Um, thirty-two, five or six. For reference, the year is thirty-one oh eight. And what did what what did he say it was? He wasn't quite sure. He said it could be thirty two oh five or thirty two oh six, which is basically a hundred years. About a century, okay. yeah. Okay, because when we step through that portal, that's the missing. Ye- Sorry, what? That's the missing hundred years. Yeah, but I'll tell Tassar when we stepped in the portal, it was thirty one oh eight. No, it couldn't have been that long. Could it? It's like time passes differently where we went. Did you take them off? The 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 uh, the, the amulets. Did you, did you ever take them off? No. No. Oh, good. Good. I don't understand what's happening. The water has now either. risen to be about two feet. And I'll, I'll mention uh, briefly what we, our adventure, and uh, we got in touch with the Dream Taker, and he sent us here to collect objects. In the amount of time it takes you to explain that, the water has risen to three feet. Yeah, this water is shining. Uh, Silas is shining the lantern around. Okay. I'll inspect the pillars. Do they look familiar at all? Or? Um, for the pillars, I'll have you make a. Uh, I will give you a choice. Uh, I will say history, medicine, or survival. I'd probably like gonna to also medicine. do a roll, but for context of of what I'm u- going from, at the start of the campaign, I analyzed a bunch of items that were given to us that had a symbol on it. Okay. That I determined that looked like some type of religious symbol, but I couldn't place. Okay. That that is what I'm going with. Going with my right back to the role. beginning of the campaign. All right. Test my memory. Yes. <laughs> ba- basically, <laughs> it looks like Paluxia symbol is is what was described. Okay. Because it was stuff that um, that we were given by Cathron. Uh Yeah, yeah. It was the temple goods that we uh, yeah mm-hmm. sold. We sold off. Ooh. All right. Nice. Um, so that being the context, what's the question? What's the what's the role intending to does, prove? Does it does any of this seem to have anything like that or anything? Because I, I know that we're supposed to be destroying that stuff. So is is that what he seems to be looking for? And is there anything with that? Okay. All right. And uh, we had uh, Silas also looking around with a lantern. Uh, make a perception roll for that. Okay. The The light of the lantern, again, a different face has lit up this time, um, seems to be skittering off the surface of the water uh, and kind of getting reflected back into the room, but not revealing anything in particular about the sides of the, of the room. Um I didn't describe them before, but they are essentially of the same uh, stone as the pillars themselves. So the entire room is kind of that way. You didn't see the floor, but uh, as you kind of look down, you can you kind of sense the same sort of tiled or, or white tiling down there as well. Um, for um, for Medric, um, nothing particularly stands out about these pillars. Uh, except for except for one crucial thing, mm-hmm. 
as the water is rising, the pillars are moving, not of their own accord, but that suggests that they are not as heavy as solid stone pillars should be. Their surface is also rather unusual, too. You're not convinced it's stone. Okay. I'll pick one up, the one that's in front of me. Okay. Um, it's, it's remarkably light for its size. It's still heavy. It's still fairly uh, large. But you realize that it's hollow and has a weird sort of almost organic cross-section to it. Um, now, for the 25, <laughs> as you look about the room and you're seeing the scattering of the light and you're seeing uh, Medrick kind of picking up uh, this stone with a lot more ease than you would have expected. Uh, it's still, again, heavy, but it's it, it moves a little bit more in the water. Certainly solid stone wouldn't have moved at all. I probably still wouldn't be able to lift it. <laughs> mm, probably not. Um, and even, you know, Medric, you're kind of getting, you know, float assist, if you will, yeah. uh, from lifting it, even though you are quite, quite strong. 16. Uh, as you look around uh, Annie, you realize that there is movement in the water, not something moving through the water. The water itself is sort of flowing and cresting and, and moving almost in waves. And as you watch the light of the lantern um, sweep around the room, you notice that when it traces across the edges of the wall, um, it leaves a little bit of water behind that in the light of the lantern distinctly forms that wave pattern of that, that uh, ancient lost being. This entire room seems to reflect the resonance of that being. Um, the other thing you notice is that when some of the light bounces back into the water, um, you see... You see that it does not stop with the floor. It seems to carry on through the floor. The floor feels very solid and very opaque, but in those instances, the light somehow travels right through it. The water is now four feet deep. It does not seem to be bothering Tassar. Um, he does kind of dip back in to press on the stone, comes back up coughing from having ingested water, but doesn't seem to be stopping at all. It's almost, what are you trying to do? I've have to uh, so hard to remember. But where you what's the purpose of chiseling on those pillars? Can I help you? I must they aren't very heavy. All of it. To give the world a chance to heal. Uh, yes, that's it. I have to was, remove all of it before it's too late. Remove what? The, the pillars or I can smash them. Yes. Uh, I'm going to, while he's talking to Tassar, I'm going to um, tell Silas to not move the light for a second, and I'm going to go underwater and try to see and touch the, touch the ground around there. Okay. Um, make an investigation roll. As you're kind of poking around and seeing where the water or the light hits the, the, the tile. Um, Medric uh, Tassar looks up to you. Holy crap. What's with all the details? Lots of 20s today. That's fantastic. <laughs> Great Next time we'll not be able to roll above a five. Hey, so like... this, is, this, is, uh, this is delightful. I love it. It's, it's kind of like return to form here. Um, so uh, Tassar looks up at you and, and kind of weighs your words and then nods his head vigorously. Yes, yes. If you can, uh, break these down. All no right. bones must remain. Bones? They're, they're pillars. Yes. Wait, you called them bones? Yes. And I looked on the inside earlier, and it's like, I noticed the, orga the organic cross-section. The manifestation of, of, and you can feel him grasping for the words, but as he speaks, they seem to come more clearly. 
the manifestation of of the goddess's influence on the world was physical at times, providing a, an, an actual structure to parts of the world, which is why some of it collapsed and some of it was was more difficult to remove. Yes, they must be pummeled, destroyed, eviscerated. So you're saying these are the bones of a dead god? Yes. Very important. All right. If they fell into the wrong hands, who knows what could happen? Do they have any kind of power? Of course. Every aspect of a god, dead or alive, has power. They are manifestations of power. They are collections of power. That must not be controlled. That is the only way we will survive. So how much... How smashed do you you want these? Utterly. All right, I'll pick up a pillar that I have in my hands and I'll smash it against the wall. Okay. Um, The water has now reached about five feet tall. So it is, it is very difficult to maneuver at this point. Um, some don't think, well, one of you is deliberately <laughs> underwater. Um, Silas is not affected because he can breathe water, um, but it is making it very difficult, Medric, for you to move. And, uh, you know, um, Tassar's head still above the water. He is sputtering every time it, it washes over his mouth, but he also doesn't seem to be paying attention to that. Uh, any idea on how to drain this water? No. It's another part of it. It doesn't want to be removed. It's it's defense. It's trying to stay. Okay, so chances are if I start smashing these pillars, the water's going to rise more quickly. So, uh, Silas, help me smash this, eh? <laughs> as you, so I'll pick up the pillar. As you both get busy on that. Um, We're smashing stuff? <laughs> Andy, oh, yeah. <laughs> Andy dips below the water. And you start to to follow the trace of where the the uh, the light crosses across these these uh, seemingly white alabaster um, um, tiles that are broken in places, um, and where the light crosses over the tiles, um, they become briefly translucent, and you are startled startled for a moment to see something hit the underside of the tile. And then it hits again. And it registers on the third hit what it actually was. It was a ginormous paw. A cat's paw. A catron paw. I'll, I'll, I'll swap, stand up and I'll be like, I, I, there's a paw. There's like a cat paw out, outside of the box or whatever. Can you grab it? It's the size of... <laughs> it, it's also on the other side of the tile. And on the other side of the tile. Like, I don't, I don't know. At this point, the water is, is uh, getting closer to six feet. How are, uh, how are Medric and uh, uh, Silas caught mid-destruction uh, when Annie pops her head up? What, were, what pose are they in trying to do this destruction? Huh? Because it literally like <laughs> muscle pose and hammer? Okay. Yeah, p- pillar, pillar above my head and I'm about to like smash it against the wall. <laughs> okay. Um, so that make me... Just smashing stuff with a stack. Make make either uh, a single roll with advantage, or you can both make rolls to smash things, whichever roll right. is appropriate. I'm going to be using uh, athletics um, because I have a lot of that. It's it's not particularly brittle, so I'm going to say the difficulty is 17 on this. Okay. Uh, Silas is going to give uh, uh, Medric advantage. Okay. That's six. Smash. Smash. 17. All right, so... Um, what does it look like when you give advantage and he's successfully able to, to smash this pillar? You can do this. Smash, smash. So, yeah. A little moral support. Okay. <laughs> I mean, he is the Phoenix champion after all. And if you have to, you could sing the song, but, um, sing the quickest version of the song, like a two second version of the song. You got this. And I remember when me and my friends were teenagers, we would just like smash shit sometimes. <laughs> that's what, that's what this reminds me of. So there's a tremendous wave of water that you push aside as you as you uh, throw this piece of pillar against the wall. And there's a resounding crash uh, that seems to echo a- around the room itself. It feels like it, it, 
it echoes back and forth as all of the uh, the tile seems to start to crackle and break. The piece that you were you threw against the wall cracks in two, uh, and then little shards of it going off in every direction. I will have uh, Nedry, uh, Nedry, uh, Medric, and uh, Silas make dexterity saving throws as, as little shards seem to spit out almost reflexively from the part that you've destroyed. What's my dex? I think it's okay. Natural one. Natural one. Ow! Five. Eight. Eight. <laughs> okay, so both of you take six points of piercing damage as little shards of bone fly out from the, the part you've, crack, you've cracked. Why oh. my face? <laughs> However, the water does recede by a foot, now at uh, five. All right, um, so if, if we smash these pillars, the water goes away. Smash another one. So I'll pick up the next one. That's next to Tassar. Allow me. Yes, yes. This is working. What All did right, you say about ready. a paw? <laughs> I don't know if... if, uh, if... Yeah, Silas is going to duck down under the water where Annie was. I'll and, hold uh, the, the lantern. The, the lantern well, seems unaffected by the water, by the way. It seems okay. sealed. So. Okay. So I'll, I'll let him go down. down. Oh, sorry. Okay, the both of you dip down. Um, yep, and where, where you shine, where you shine the the light once more, you see as if the light is traveling right through. There's nothing for a second, and then a uh, a humanoid eye seems to peer up through, followed by some some uh, uh, rather uh, urgent paw strikes. You do recognize the face of Catherine on the other side. Well. Uh, Silas is going to cast Shillelagh. Okay. I wave. Unable to breathe because I'm in water. Cast wave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you got? Uh, yeah, just... Why not? This is... It's sonic energy, not uh, electrical, so hopefully this won't be too bad. Electrocute uh, us all. This is how the campaign ends. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so S- Silas is going to booming blade the uh, oh. bottom of the... Uh, yeah, the, the, the booming part only takes place if they move, so it might not be as... Yeah, uh, well, plus... he does get some extra damage from the initial yeah. hit. It's just, this but, is one uh, of those cases where, like, do I do I want to talk about hydrostatic shock or not? Uh mm-hmm. Hey, Silas is used to it. He just told, uh, he's he's hoping that Annie and the others have their heads above water. <laughs> I'm smashing stuff. My head's totally yeah. above the water. Yeah, Medric do, is you, fine. do you tell me to do? <laughs> yeah, well, if if Annie was down under it, he'd he'd point up. Yeah, okay. go up. Like you up. Okay, I do that. Um, it is difficult to swing underwater, so it will still be a roll, but it's not very difficult. Um, it just to determine whether it's the first strike or the second, essentially. Similarly with uh, with Medri, uh, with Medric. Sorry, I have a character named Nedri, so it's sneaking in here now. <laughs> um, with uh, Medric, uh, I will have you make another uh, attack roll, essentially, to try to smash, or an athletics roll if you prefer. Athletics uh, roll, smash. Okay, and how does the roll underneath go as well? Uh, yeah, because uh, because uh, Silas water movement uh he doesn't get a penalty for oh anything. perfect yeah 13 uh, okay so 13 that's a and 12, 12 to hit okay and actually yeah it's uh, it's see. even less of a Four. requirement to, to hit because you can move underwater without any difficulty yeah um, you get nine damage anyway nine damage okay whoops all right there is a resounding uh, 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 boom in the water, which is felt by the other three more than uh, seen. However, it does coincide with when Medric uh, throws another piece against the wall, and it sounds like it explodes. <laughs> uh, and yet, it doesn't seem to have much damage, somehow. Uh, and yet, uh, so so maybe you were more effective than you thought. Maybe you destroyed the room rather than the pillar. You're not sure. Uh, but the water does not rise nor fall in this instance. Um, underwater, you can see uh, a, a crack forming in the uh, tile below. 
Um, the crack is not in the sort of starburst pattern you would have expected, but in fact, it's a crack that takes a long, long straight line and then curves at the end. And in that instant, uh, you kind of recognize this symbol, weirdly enough. At least it's a part of the symbol of Paluxia herself. Do we know, do we know the name Paluxia at all? Or? I don't I think so. I've been, I've been trying to remember if I'd ever slipped the name or not, and I don't think so because they try not to say the nope. name because that would we be also... We know the name of Lux. The, yeah, and, and certainly the dead god or the, the is, is part of what they would say, so probably not. The fact that you guys as players have heard the name before makes me slip once in a while, but the intention is that that name probably is never spoken okay. because yeah. that gives it power, as you well know yeah. with Taraz as well. Oh, I, I, I do remember enough? we did find somewhere written the name Lux. Very possible. So that's what been... we, we, would, we wouldn't know Paluxia, but we do know Lux. Yeah. Um, so it's going to require another smash. And if you wish to change something or do something differently, this is a good opportunity to do it. But you do feel like you're making some progress. I'll ask Castor if, this, if, if the pillar I just smashed is smashed good enough. It's a good start. More? Definitely. All right. So I'll pick it up again and smash it against the wall at a better angle this time. Okay. Um, I'm also going to, because I would have noticed that the water went down as well because I was up there. Uh, I'm going to start like trying to like damage it so that it's easier to crack um, with um, um, with vice. Okay. So you're going to kind of pre-crack them so to make it to make uh, uh Medric's yeah. life a little easier okay why don't you like, go ahead and like make... cause damage so that it's easier to break uh yep uh so um go ahead and roll um we'll say for this one uh the, the 14 isn't quite enough or the eight rather yeah. isn't quite enough um but hopefully uh annie can hand you a uh, a pre-cracked one um, did you get a roll in there for that, Annie? Okay. Um, you are striking underwater, so it will be disadvantage for you, which, sorry to say, I mean, you got a 25. Probably going to do pretty well. Um, you're also muted at the moment, so I'm not sure if you're cursing me out or just trying to... All, all I said was that where to go because I couldn't find the button okay. again. No problems, 23, um, easily done. Um, Annie kind of gestures at one uh, that she's been sort of tinkering away with, and you can see there's mm -hmm. a crack already forming in it, so you'll get advantage on the next strike. Um, nice. What is Silas doing underwater, or what, uh, same thing as the first time, or do you have a different idea? Um, actually, Silas is going to stand there, and with, then with the staff out, uh, he's going to... Uh, Okay. Uh, Eldritch bolt it. Okay. So just blam, blam, blam with force energy. Okay. Um, it's a it's a static uh, thing. Is there a, there is an attack roll? Okay, that's fine. Um, it's mostly so you hit it in the same place and you don't just you know damaging other parts of the floor. Um, I don't know if I have that damage. Oh no, that was the attack roll. Well, there's there's okay. three yep. there's three uh, bolts, right? So yep. Um, that's fourteen force damage. Okay, a little less of impact on the water this time um, as it strikes down and starts to scorch across. Again, the impact is strange because it draws out the other two major lines of the wave. Um, and you can make a religion or uh, arcana roll if you prefer. Either interpretation can get you somewhere. As for back on the surface, um, does... Uh, uh, pair of tens. Pair of okay. Yep, this is definitely weird. <laughs> it's about as far as you get with the, with the ten, I'm afraid. Uh, mm -hmm. This definitely should not happen. This is not natural. Weird. Um, Tiles don't suddenly become transparent. No. No, um, it doesn't change the nature of the tiles under the light, but um, it's just that this, this you're used to scorching a lot of things with this, and this is definitely not the same as any of those. Uh, do we have another roll from Medric with advantage? Smash. And smash again. 13. Oof. 
unfortunately, it's not quite. Uh, it's not quite. The, the The water is still not dropping, and you're starting to feel it everywhere. It's seeping in underneath your armor and all of that places. Yeah. That even with your warm skin, uh, it's now turning into kind of tepid water around your skin, which is not really any better. Um, it's Stupid not water. You're, you're you're not fiery enough to be able to just d- to push away the water. Unfortunately. Um, you still have advantage on the roll because the preparation was still done, but it's taking you a little longer than you expected. Um, okay. Annie, you definitely I'll feel like you had an one. effect, but <laughs> yeah, you might want to prepare another, another log. There are four pillars in total. You've already smashed one. So there's basically, uh, the one that, uh, Medric wasn't able to smash, the one that's prepared, and then there's a fourth one. So you can prepare up to two more. Um, okay, perfect. I'll, I'll start preparing another one. Okay. Um, you see that the tile is starting to buckle um, where you struck it, Silas. The weirdest part is it's not buckling downward and it's not smashing outward. It's buckling up toward you. Huh. Isn't that trying to hex the tiles? I don't think you can get a hex on it because there's no real target there. Yeah, um, no problem. Uh, he'll just keep uh, slamming into it with the Eldritch Bolts. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that next one, Annie, you're just not able to get the strike on it. The The water is, is kind of, it's one of those things, it's really annoying when you go into water and you push through and it kind of veers off to one side slightly. <laughs> um, Medric, you can still try for the one that was already prepared. Smash. Hey, there we, there we go. And this time it finally smashes quite quite handily against the side. And even the little chunks start to disintegrate in the water, strangely enough. Um, you're not sure if it's a combination of what you're doing and what whatever Silas is doing under the water. You're not really sure what the hell he's doing under there, but you do see spl- flashes every once in a while. Um, the bones are made to the sugar. next pillar. <laughs> uh, so there's no more prepared ones because Annie wasn't able to prepare another one. There's two left, the one that you weren't able to break before and the one that Annie is going to prepare next, I think. Okay. Um, the race is on to see whose explosive effect happens first, I guess, really. Let's see what uh, what the next round for each each of you is. Um, All right. I'll pick up the pillar. Oh, did the, did the water go down? The, yes, nice the water went one. down to about four feet. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Um, I had a crappy 11 damage. Oh, that's, yeah, that's weird. Okay. Um, it is effective. This time, it kind of completes the sigil on the floor. And the sigil begins to glow slightly. Again, in Congress with, with your expectations, but it is happening. And the floor is starting to buckle inward along those, along those cracks. Uh, another pillar has been prepared. Um, so, uh, Medric, if you were patient enough to wait for uh, Andy to prepare the pillar, you can roll with advantage. Yep. Well, there's a one, and... Oof. 14. <laughs> Oof. Unfortunately, uh, uh, the the floor beneath you kind of shifts a bit as it's starting to buckle from whatever Silas is doing. So it throws you off slightly and it ends up kind of slamming into the water just at the edge of the wall and kind of coasting in and not really destroying it. Okay. All right. Next attempt. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I will go prepare the other pillar. Okay. I will smash again unless Silas is also is also smashing. Uh, Twelve wasn't quite the threshold I think we set before. I wanted to scroll up on the wrong window here. Sorry. Um, so unfortunately, that one's not not prepared. Um, but you still have a prepared one, and then there's still a smashing underneath you. Smash. Well, one soft uh, damage, but the other thirteen is nice. Mm. Um, as you strike. Something is let loose. Um, There is a tendril of nothingness that erupts from the edge of the of the broken tile that you've you've scorched and bent. Almost like the growing void seems to appear within. Uh, pushing up at the water, not the other way around, as again you might expect. There is a tremendous uh, uh, thump on the other side, and this weird transmission of sound that goes somehow from um, a void 
to when there's a strike to moving through the water to your ears. So translate that as you will. As you recognize the sound of a frustrated roar, um, as from below, Cathron collides with the uh, crack you've made and pushes through, one paw uh, through the, the edge of it um, but and scrabbling a bit, but then retreating. A hole has been opened up, and you feel like between the two of you, it's not going to take much more longer time. Now, for the pillars, the two Smash. that remain. 13, 14, God uh, damn it! Yeah, unfortunately, you're having a hard time uh, just... Uh, the, the, the shifting of the room and the sudden change in light as the ubiquitous glow that seemed to be coming from this room is now being shaken and shivered by the, the shifting of the water. Uh, it's hard to kind of find that, that right balance. Last so, one has been prepared. Awesome. Last one has been prepared. Um, uh, Silas can I make another, 20 would. Make another <laughs> yeah. strike with advantage this time. Um, and Actually, the advantage doesn't really matter because it's, it's easy to hit. I'll say you can re-roll one of the damages um, and take the better result. Is 23 enough? Because I may not be able to have to re-roll I mean, it. that's pretty tremendous. Yeah. I'll say that with the effort you're making, you're kind of, this 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 spot where the paw has come through is now being ripped open like it's a zipper. And you're just kind of ripping up along these lines and all of them now, all these traces of this of the stylized wave, the pattern of the dead god, uh, are now emerging outward and surging with it uh, comes Cathron, stuck at first because uh, she's much larger than the hole, but with a look of determination and a roar of rage, um, she pushes through this hole. Um, that does destabilize the water, but I'm not going to make you roll this advantage. You can still roll the advantage rolls, uh, Medric, as you're... As you're uh, moving through. 17 and 21. There we go. Ah! As a third pillar is smashed and over to one side, the water drops down now to a couple of feet, actually down to two feet, um, possibly because it seems to be getting, getting infested by void of some kind. It's hard to really know. Uh, Catherine emerges up out of the water. It's this impossible sight of a very large being coming out of the floor somehow, out of a void. Uh, and then, I thought it was you. And then uh, landing heavily into the water once more, sending it splashing. Uh, and a roar of frustration and relief um, comes from Catherine. And a look of Catherine. surprise and uh, 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 delight comes from, uh, from Tassar. Um, there's a, 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 a brief moment where it's kind of everybody in shock and then still related perhaps distantly, maybe the ancestors of cats, maybe the, the, uh, the, the very essence of what became the domesticated or, or mortal animal cats. Catherine goes for a very large shake to get some of the water out of her fur, which sends it flying across the room. She sees the last pillar there uh, and with an enormous swipe of her paw, let's see if she can do it. Probably not. Um, uh, is it? I forgot how to roll that. Okay, so plus that. Catherine, welcome uh, back. Help us smash this. There's only one left. That is not the right roll. So that's one roll and hey. a second roll. Yeah, her paw comes crashing down on the pillar. It shatters all of the uh, tile in the room shatters simultaneously. The water drains out to the sides, not through the rift that was created in the, in the floor, which itself seems to be being replaced by solid stone. And the room is, is decimated, destroyed. Uh, imagine a glass room in which a sonic boom has gone off. All these little shreds are there. Everybody, please make a dexterity saving throw as there are shards of glass flying everywhere. Not 20. Nice. And an 18 and a 15. And I'll roll for Tassar, who's not really likely to do much good about that. Nope. And for Catherine, Catherine is just going to take it. Uh, and it is eight points of slashing damage as this is peppered around the room. For those that saved, it's only four points. Who saved? 
Uh, all the PCs saved. Uh, it was difficulty Great. 15, but there are big creatures to hide behind, so. Um, and then in, in that moment, um, all of the stuff sort of drifts down to the ground. And even before the shards touch the ground, they start to powder. And before they reach the ground, it's almost like snow melting away in a very hot room. And then you're left in a very, very plain, uh, gray stone room. Not of paved stones or of, of singular stones, but as if almost like cement, flat, featureless, and dull. Like life has simply gone out of this place where it was once a leftover vestige of glory. Now it's, it's just gone. In the light of the lantern, See, one small shard remains, and it glows slightly. Grabbing it. Yeah. You feel that that's (laughs) that's the emblem of this room, you feel. Tassar leaps up, cries with a rather unseemingly amount of of joy, and runs over to Catherine and hugs her mightily around the neck, to which Catherine tries to look dignified. (laughs) <laughs> different, but ends up kind of leaning in and nuzzling Tassar a bit. You get the feeling Aww. these two have known each other for a long time. Tassar also seems to be draining away some of that age that he was feeling. And then kind of steps back. Straightens Are you back up, for good? I'll ask Catherine. Straightens up his uh, robes a little bit, which is hard to do because they're soggy. <laughs> um, I think, my friends, I have... I have returned. It was okay, a strange this place? journey. I had hoped you knew what this place was. I saw it only as a light in the distance, and I knew that there might be hope there. Where I was was featureless and dark, and the distance like stars, but nothing like land. I floated for an eternity. It was that sounds awful. Distressing. The other... The other places here seem to be dream realms, but I'm not sure about this one. Hmm. Yeah, we were sent here by somebody called the Dream Taker. I do not know them. And he will... passed us this lantern, and right, Silas has, Silas has the lantern, so I'll just point at it. I will ponder on this. Actually, I think uh, Annie has the lantern right now. Okay. Yeah. You see a, a, a deep look of thought cross across Catherine's face, and Tassar, too, um, kind of scratches his chin a bit, and the two of them fade away. As Catherine's fading away, Silas says, Nice to see you again. You can pay us back for this later. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to actually put Catherine on the map, but Catherine is actually there. Uh, but then she and Tassar both... Uh, so just oh, where the how things line up, it's Catherine with uh, Ronnie with three ends. Oh, that's weird. Catherine, on. Hopefully, that actually did rescue Catherine and not just in her dreams. Yeah. <laughs> or else, that's very mean. <laughs> The water having drained away, the room seems somewhat calm and peaceful. You all feel some fatigue. Something which you really hadn't noticed since you got to this place. Sorry, we feel what? Fatigue. Okay. Do we actually have a level of exhausted or we're just generally... You don't have a level of exhaustion, no. But one of the things that you know about the shadow, or at least has been expressed to you, is that it, you cannot sleep. But right now, you feel like you could. And with that, we will bring the session to a close because we have some people that I think have to get going. Um, it is going to be a little bit of an extended break again because I'm traveling in two weeks. 
unfortunately, but it, uh, I think we're, we've got pretty good trajectory and some motion forward here. And hopefully I've intrigued folks enough that they're like, i got to get back to these rooms. What are we doing with the next room? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to thank uh, my players very much for being patient with me as I, as I try to sort out my own mind and what I wanted to have next. I wanted the experience of the, of the Dream Takers world to be um, unusual. So hopefully I'm hitting that mark. Yeah. Um, as always, if you enjoyed this and you watched live on Twitch, thank you very much. There's not a lot of people who do, and very few people who say hello, but please uh, do so. You can go over to Facebook, look for Watchers of the Drowned Isles if you want to chat with any of us or you want to read the summaries that uh, Pat so diligently put together. Um, you may also be watching this on YouTube, youtube.com slash ENCAF1. I have a couple of different playlists that are related to the Legends of the Drowned Isles. There's sort of a master playlist, and there's one specifically for ca Campaign 2. Campaign 1 never really finished. <laughs> it, got, it was another victim of, of COVID at the time. And maybe we'll go back to, eventually. Maybe we'll go back to those characters and figure out what's going on. But we're learning more and more about uh, the disaster that was set up that they, they discovered a thousand years later. Um, but definitely check that out and, uh, we shall have, I think another episode, as I said, in four weeks in late June. So, uh, have a delightful day. And once again, players, thanks for, uh, for kicking in. Have a good night.